Well, hello, friends, and welcome to the True Tone Lounge. Today, we we're very honored to have a very special guest that we've been uh, chasing him for years, and finally, he relented. So, to give a little background, you know, and our brothers across the the sea have uh, have a guy named John Mayall, who through his band came uh, individuals like Eric Clapton and uh, you know Peter Green and Mick Taylor and Coco Montoya. Well, here in Nashville, we had the Don Kelly Band. And through his band came guys from, from Brent Mason and Red Volkart and, uh, and all the way up to, you know, more current guys like J.D. Simo and Daniel Donato and Luke McQuarrie. And uh, just a, an amazing band that Don led from 1981 up until just a year or two ago, and he retired. And so we're very fortunate to get to, to have Don here and to get him to tell his story and just how he came about being you know, the band leader and kind of a coach for all these guitar players that came through his band. So, Don, thank well, you I so much. I was referred to as General Patton one time. <laughs> That's perfect. I'll take that. Yeah, General, <laughs> General Patton. So, so, Don, I know that you know, you're wearing a Wichita Falls shirt, and I know That's that you're right. from Wichita Falls. So that was, was that where you were born? July 11, 1946. Nice. To JT and Verna Kelly. Yeah. And how, you know, how did you get into music? Well, this young fellow right here is David Holcomb. Okay. I, I, I was in an elementary school. I've been in 10 elementary schools. My dad moved every time the rent was due. I love my dad, don't get me wrong. <laughs> and uh, uh, anyway, we moved around a lot. Um, my mother's folks lived in Fort Worth, Texas, and my dad's folks were in Wichita Falls. So I spent most of my time there, but I, I did uh, spend part of the third grade in Fort Worth. Well, we came, came back to Wichita Falls in the middle of the year, and I went to uh, San Jacinta Elementary School. And the first day I was there, I meet this guy right here. That's David Hawkham. And uh, after school, he said... Uh, uh, you you want to uh, come over to my house and play? And I said, well, where do you live? He said, you walk out of S San Jacinto, there's an alley. In, in Texas, in the 50s, the, the alleys ran this way. You know, here's a block of, of houses on a paved street. And here are two alleys that cross, right. and they're red dirt, which turns to red mud. Mm -hmm. Anyway... We lived in a little shotgun house at the end of this alley. Well, right over here was another little shotgun house, and that's where David lived. So after school, I was going home, just walked down the alley, I was there. Well, if you take a right there at the crossroads, there's David's house. So he said, let's go over, go over to my house and play. I said, well, is your mom and dad home? He said, no, they work. So we go over there, and he opens the door, and we go in this little shack-looking place. That's pretty much about what it was. Yeah. And uh, on the back of the couch was a, a little guitar case, and about that big. And I, I don't know, I walked in, I, I said, uh, what is that? He said, it's a ukulele. I said, a what? <laughs> he said, uh, it's a ukulele. And I, I said, can you play it? And this guy's so bashful, you know. And he said, I played a little bit, and I said, so he got it out. And uh, he started playing that thing, and I swear, I still think about it to this day. I was going, that's, that's amazing. For an 11-year-old kid, I'm just sitting there. I didn't say a word until he finished. And uh, I said, uh, uh, would you uh, come down to, to my, my house and play that for my mama? He said, uh, well, you know, I'm not supposed to go anywhere but home when I get out because my mom is not there. And I said, well, it's just right there. 
So I drag him down there with that ukulele, and my mom's in there uh, uh, washing dishes in the kitchen. You know, the little shotgun houses. You, know, you go in this yes. door, and it's Long back. and narrow, yeah. Yeah. So we get to the kitchen part of it, and she's got her back to us. I said, Mama, I want you to hear this kid play this little guitar. Boy, he fires it up. He does uh, <laughs> Love the Lives Night of the Year. Have you ever heard Al Falsa do that in the Little Rascals? Anybody? Yes, anyway. yes, I have heard that. Okay, yes. that's yeah. what it sounded like. Yeah. And uh, my mother was going. And he did about two or three songs. He did, he did one song that had more changes than I could play right now. He did, what was that, Joe? Dark Town Strutter's Ball. You ever heard of that song? Yeah. Okay, sure. he ripped that off. <laughs> and, and my mother, she, she don't know what to say. How old was he? He was 11. Wow. And I said, Mama, if you'll get me one of them, I promise I'll learn how to play it. Well, my mother, bless her heart, she has about $20 a week grocery money for five people. And uh, I didn't hear, I mean, he, he played, she just wore him out with it. He just, and after he started, there was no bachelor anymore. His step up. Yeah. So. At the end of the day, she said, uh, uh, the next day was a Saturday. She, and she got me up. She said, come on, we're going to go downtown. So we'll go downtown. She takes $9 out of that $20 she has grocery money and bought this. Wow. And uh, this was left of it. Anyway, she That's bought that. It's a beautiful harmony uke, you know, and yeah. I, I loved the, the era when they would, that, the, they, the Western motifs or the different, yeah, right, where they yeah. would paint them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is two of the original strings on this <laughs> guitar, and uh, uh, my sister, kid, they had fun with this while I was gone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'd find it out in the yard, you know, yeah. but anyway, it's still here. And uh, this guy here, there wouldn't be anything. There's no telling where I would be. Being poor like we were, you know, a lot, a lot of people, no telling where I'd ended up, you know. Uh, but he showed me uh, how to play uh, the ukulele. And uh, each year, his mom would buy him another instrument. So the second year, the, all of this came from Sears and Roebuck. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he, he got a mandolin. And his brother played fiddle. So he got a mandolin. So my mom bought me a silver tone acoustic guitar. Nice. So we went and played Ragtime Annie and, uh, and Wednesday Night Waltz and, and stuff on the mandolin. Well, a uh, couple of years go by, he gets an electric silver tone guitar and a, a 212, uh, I, I forget what it was. It might have been a silver tone too. Uh, no reverb, but 212 amplifier. And uh, he got a two pickup harmony guitar, and I got a, what's the little Fender with one pickup, dual sonic? Yeah, or the, or the Music Master, or. Yeah, 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 it was the one pickup one. Yeah. I got that. And uh, the first song he learned was uh, Ventures, of course, yeah. like everybody else. Well, he learned. The ear was phenomenal, so he learned the whole song. Then he taught me the chords, you know, yeah. like this. You know, no, put your finger here, Don. You know, but he stuck with me through all of that. And then uh, we got a little band, and uh, we were trying to think of a name. His mother loved Clark Gable, and he had a movie out called The Misfits. Yeah. And we took that name. And it was me and him and a little drummer uh, named Timmy Looney. He was way younger than us, but he had a full set of drums. And we would tow his drums from his house three or four blocks away and set them up in this little shotgun living room. Of course, David's mom and dad were working, and we'd go at the venture song, you know. And uh, then we got in high school, we started doing the sock hop gym stuff and playing for somebody's birthday party free so we could play. And uh, we added a bass player. Well, his grades got bad, so they, they wouldn't let him play no more. So uh, 
we had to have a bass player. So I just quit playing guitar and, and uh, uh, started playing bass. Then uh, we uh, uh, got a piano player, and he lives here. Uh, Dwight Scott was his name. Incredible B3 player he turned out to be later on. We went to that. And I'm making this real short because it's a long way to go. Uh, Dwight uh, started with us, and the, the drummer was a rudimental champion that we had after the young guy. He was two years older than me, too. And uh, we are all in high school. Uh, Dwight, we... What changed our life was the music back then. Uh, Booker T and the MGs, everybody had a B3 in Texas. Right. And that, that's four people picking that B3 up on dollies and carrying it up flights of stairs. Yes, I've, but I've moved one before. We didn't yeah. play without it. Yeah. You know, a 122 Leslie and a B3. That's because it's a sound. It's, yeah. a, it's a wonderful sound. And, yeah. and we, I got to see the band after they left Bob Dylan in a club in Oklahoma City called the Sundowners. That was a changer right there. Yeah, so so you saw you saw. I the saw Hawks. the band in a room not a whole lot bigger than this. Yeah, Robbie Robertson, the whole thing. It was, and that we were we were too young. Me and David, we couldn't. We we're twenty one. We couldn't get in there. Yeah. But the other two guys, they could get in. So we dress in our band suits, the Beatles, of colorless blazer and the yes, little skinny. Anyway, yeah. we had that on. We had played uh, the Air Force Base in uh, uh, Oklahoma City. Okay. The NCO club. We yeah. played all of those. And so we I don't know how we even found out that it had to be the organ player because he had his nose to the grindstone and the ear open. He knew where everybody was. But we had heard the Hawks version of Who Do You Love? Yeah, which is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So we were hooked, you know, that guitar tone, you know, and uh, everybody wanted it. And David had a telecaster. Yeah. And uh, so we get in there at the club. They stop us at the door. And uh, the organ player said, look, we were a band, and we, did, we wondered if we could come in and, and, uh, and hear, uh, listen to uh, the Hawks. And the guy said, well, uh, how old are you? And Dwight was old enough and the drummer. And he said, well, you guys can come in, but, uh, boys, you, you can't come in. Boy, I, I thought I was going to cry. Because <laughs> we we seen they're getting ready to play. They're standing up there, the heroes. Yeah. yeah. And especially the guitar player, Robbie Freak, you know, for that one song. Yeah. So, uh, and, and so, well, we couldn't stop them from going. We just said, you know, we'll just wait out here. We started out the door, and the, and the guy working the door said, hey, wait a minute. He said, I'll tell you what, guys, you go over there in that corner. And you stand, you don't do nothing. You stand right over there. And, and uh, so we... <laughs> you stood we like statues. The door, you know, we're sitting over there with the, the beat look, and, and uh, boy, they started, and it was... It was it, right then, we just changed her for that band. And yeah. That's all we did. That's all we wanted to do. There was, they... they they did uh, Little Liza Jane in rounds. And we're just mouth dropping open. And Robbie Robinson and Rick Danko, me being a bass player, uh, it was just a killer. The whole thing was, I was never the same after that. Yeah. And, and, and I would have been, I don't know what I'd started doing, uh, uh, but that guy let us come in and watch. Had he not done that, uh, it was amazing. And not meeting this guy. Yeah. You know, none of this would ever happen to me, you know. I might have been in the penitentiary. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know where you've been. So is that where some of some of the some of the love of the of the telecaster and the R and and of course they were kinda they did a fair amount of R and B music and such. I that, guess you were already kinda into oh, Booker T and Yeah, we yeah. copied their version of Love Light. Uh they did uh the work song. You ever heard that song? Yeah. Yeah. They did that and it just killed us. Uh, you know, we we stole everything they had. Yeah. It, that we could, you know. And, and the, the organ player being musically trained and a brutal mental drummer could play anything. Uh, 
But after that, we rehearsed every damn day, every yeah. day. And we had to drag the B3 out and put it in somebody's house, load it back up and go play the Airmen's Club so we could work. Yeah. Yeah, hell, and when I was a, a senior in high school, I was making $90 a week. That was a lot of money. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it was just a big change. But that being able to go see those guys play, I mean, I, I could walk over and touch the organ. That's how close I was. Yeah. And that, that was a like, game changer for me. And they've been my favorite band ever since. Well, next question. <laughs> <laughs> You just wind, wind, wind them up and he goes. I'm just going to say right now, for the, for, the, for the viewing audience, know that we have a little bit of a peanut gallery here. We have, we, we have Don's, you know, uh, the, and still the Kelly's Heroes, you know, bass player, you know, Joe Fick, and we have his guitar player, Luke McCreary, and, and you know, of course, we also have... Say hi, uh, everybody. Yeah, oh, you just say hi. For, yes, and we also, you know, have, have the, the True Tone crew here. So, okay. Get us from uh, playing kind of bass, playing R and B music, and get us into like playing with Joe Stampley and 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 such. So, so uh, get us there. Okay, well, there's some funny stuff before that, but well, we'll tell pass it. No, it. tell it. <laughs> no, no. Uh, take it. I, I, uh, where was I? Well, you. Oh, the you, band. You, yeah, you had talked about yeah. the band, and 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 who doesn't love the band? And also, there's such different eras of the band because you know the era that you saw them at. Oh you yeah. know, They were this high powered, oh, you know, R and B group. They were dressed. Yeah. And this comes to a Vietnam story. I'll tell you that. Okay, they're in Gordian suits. And they've all got this uh, razor blended style back. I called it duck tail haircuts. I mean. Yeah. Never out. Looked like George Jones hair. Yeah. Uh, all of them. And uh, uh, no beards, none of that. Yeah. They all had pointed toe beetle boots. Uh, and we, we, from then on, we dressed like them. I um, mean, <laughs> dressed like them every yeah. day. Yeah. It didn't matter <laughs> yeah, if you were just right, going to yeah. the grocery store. You're gonna, yeah. <laughs> and what was the question? I lost my train of thought. No, it was, uh, you know, we were talking about the, the band and how they had the, the different eras. You know, of course, there was the era when they were the Hawks and they were playing behind Dylan, uh, in which, and then of course you yeah. have the transition. Well, you know, yeah. you, you, uh, you're talking about the guitar players that had uh, uh, the uh, that thing they did with Hawkins, Ronnie Hawkins. You know that he taught them guys. Yeah. You know he told them what to do. Hell, Robbie Robinson wasn't even playing guitar; he was bass at first. Yeah, and uh, he he told them, "Yeah, it's showtime, boys." And he made him rehearse. He was a he was a taskmaster. Oh yeah, which, he was. Did, did you learn from that? Uh, nah, nah. Yeah. You know when Brent and I were at the coach, we never we rehearsed one day a week. We had to learn one new song on the club owner. You know, yeah, some slug piece of crap, but we did it. You know, <laughs> learn but one I, new song a week. Band, That's not too bad. It's like you say that when I first heard them, that was that was my favorite. You yeah, know? that was. That was just awesome, and then, uh, all right, uh, from there, uh, I played in a, in, in a few different groups. So what happened was uh, I, I got uh, the guitar player, this guy. He he was a he's very smart. Uh, he was smart enough to know that that he. Uh, he didn't want to do this for a living. I mean, we played the nightclub and stuff, and we made good money in high school. But after that, he he went. There was a four-year college in Wichita Falls, Midwestern. He went there. He wanted a degree in something. Yeah. And uh, so he was uh, he was in college. So he quit playing. Well, the Misfits they kept the name, the organ player, and uh, the drummer. They kept the name. And they hired Carl Flick. Carl Flick taught me how to play Hideaway, or part of it. He is a big, heavyset guy, played 335, monster, monster guy. And uh, he had a brother as a bass player. So they replaced me with, with his brother, and Carl played guitar, and the drummer uh, had got this uh, uh, singer, lead singer, Jimmy Harris, monster, Bobby Blue Bland, mm. amazing singer. So they kept playing the military basses. 
Well, I'm in boot camp. I got drafted in 1967. And uh, I get a letter in the mail. My mother said, son, uh, you need to read this. So she handed it to me. And I swear, this is what that letter said. Your friends and neighbors have selected you. That was the first line, I swear to God. <laughs> and it was a draft notice. Yeah. So, uh, uh, <laughs> your friends and neighbors yeah, have selected That's what it said. That's, yeah. that's and, not uh, what you want. And it gave a date for me to get on a bus with uh, three other guys from Wichita Falls, go to Dallas, do the physical. Of course, they just felt my forehead and say, You're good, bud. That's right. And, You're good uh, to go. You're a warm uh, body. Uh, I got sent to Fort Polk. Louisiana, mm -hmm. and I had played that uh, NCO club before that. Yeah, I knew Leesville, Louisiana, horrible place. Anyway, I'm in basic training, and uh, about I had, I don't know, it was a uh, eight weeks basic training, eight weeks uh, whatever your MOS or your job, right. whatever you're going to do. You either got uh, Light vehicles are Tigerland. Tigerland means next stop, Vietnam. Mm. Well, I go to the board after my second eight weeks. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. The drummer, Carl Flick, and his brother, and the lead singer are coming back from Oklahoma City. And the singer was driving. He fell asleep. They had a bridge in Buncan, killed them all but him. And, and me and the drummer were, you know, and I couldn't go home, couldn't do nothing. Yeah. And, uh, uh, boy, I devastated this guy. Yeah. You know, uh, I got drafted, and he quit to go to school or would have been there. Yeah. You know, one way or the other. So uh, uh, after that happened... Uh, uh, the second eight weeks of the Army was over, and you had to go to the bulletin board to find out which one you got. Yeah. Well, I went down there, and it said, uh, uh, Donald Joe Kelly, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. So I got light vehicles. I did my eight weeks of light vehicles. I went to 48 miles from my hometown, right across the river, Red River, yeah. From Wichita Falls is Lawton, Oklahoma. Yeah, boy, that's the breeding ground for some of the best R&B musicians everywhere comes through that town. There is a, a B and C Street with nothing but bars, and uh, I was uh, working in a message center at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, the rest of the first year in the army, and uh, I driving a truck and. Uh, I was playing music. I lived in Wichita Falls, get up at 4.30 in the morning, drive to Fort Sill, and do my day. I thought I was going to be the, the rest of my time in the Army. And I played a little downtown with some trios. So it was, it was like a job. You know, of course, I had to have real short hair. So. Yeah. Well, I come into work, and I was working for an uh, E-9, a warrant officer, and a message center. I delivered mail to the post around there, and... And I go in there, and uh, boy, he's got his head in his hands, and it looks like his dog died. And I said, what's up, Sarge? He said, well, I got a little bad news for you, Donald. And uh, he said, come here. And so he has this long sheet of paper, and there's a million names on there. And it, down about midways, it's circled in red. <laughs> Donald Joe Kelly, report to whatever it said, South Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Boy, my heart dropped. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he said, Don, I said, I, I thought you were going to be able to keep you here the whole time. He said, I, I had uh, uh, a month left before I had to go to uh, San Francisco. <laughs> so he said, I tell you what, Don, I said, don't come back to work. He said, you just you stay home. He said, this is your report date. Uh, don't miss it because I'll get in trouble. You know, and I said, I'll be there. Well, my brother is an Oakland, California police officer. And he lives in right outside of, of San Francisco. He was in the Navy, and when he got out there, he married a girl, and he stayed there. And he, he was a uh, 
on the Oakland, the roughest police department in the United States. Yeah. I mean, so he meets me at the, I've never been on an airplane. I get on an airplane and Dallas scared the hell out of me. So I got to San Francisco and he was there, of course. And I, I never was hang out with my brother. I mean, we were, we were brothers. And he was two years older. He had his friends, and I had this guy. Yeah. And, uh, but we were still brothers. And uh, I got to tell this part. I had three days off, so he takes me to his house, and he has two gir- little baby girls and, and his wife. And uh, the third day come up, and it's time for me to go. So he takes me to the uh, airport. And back then, you flew commercial to Vietnam. I mean, that steward us everything. And uh, <laughs> so we're standing at the gate, you know. Uh, I'll never forget this. And <laughs> he said, uh, uh, you know uh, that I'd go for you if I could. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> I still think about it. But that was my brother. James Kelly is his name. Yeah, that's, qu- that's quite the statement. I'd go for you if I could. Yeah. Yeah. Boy. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I go to Vietnam, and they got no place for me. You know, I had no place for my MOS. Yeah. I, I get to uh, to Saigon, Thompson Nook Air Force Base, and a holding barracks. And every morning, I got to report to formation to find out if they're sending me anywhere. Yeah. So uh, two weeks ago, and I said, hell, send me home. Yeah. You don't need me over here. But about the you know, first part of the third week, I go out there, and they say, Kelly stepped forward, and I go out there, and he said, uh, you're going to uh, Da Nang, which is way up, Yeah, you know. And uh, so, uh, you know, you you report tomorrow, you get on the bus, they take you to the uh, to the flight line, and you go. And so that next morning, I get up, and I get on a bus. It's just me on this bus, and, and the bus driver. That's spooky. And it's just a regular school-looking bus, military, yeah. of course. Well, there's no windows in this bus. There's Constantina wire all around this bus, which yeah. is Bob wire. Yes. You know. And, it, I mean, you can, it's just con- everywhere. And uh, I'm sitting up by the driver. I'm sitting this way, and he's driving this way. And he is hardcore. His fatigues are just faded out. He's dark as that table from the sun. And uh, he didn't say two words to me, nothing. So finally I said, uh, can I ask you a question? I, I said, what is that, all this wire? In, uh, um, there's no windows in here, this wire. He said, well, you don't want them pitching a hand grenade in here, do you? <laughs> I said, no, <laughs> I, I don't. But that's all he said to me. And uh, so I get to the airport, and they put me on a C-130, which scared the living hell yeah, out of me, too. That's a huge plane. Yeah. yeah. And the, no seat. You sit on the floor. And I go to Da Nang, which is further on up there. Yeah, which is closer to the to the, the Another bad action. Another holding barracks. Yeah. And I get in there, and I stay three or four days, and go to the next place. We don't have any place for you, son. So you're going back to Chu Lai. So backtrack. So I get to Chu Lai, and they still don't name me, so they put me driving a colonel. Oh, I hated that. Yeah. You, you report, you sit there in his office, which was a Quonset hut, and you don't budge unless he wants to go somewhere. Yeah. So uh, you're just wait waiting on the on the yeah. on the bird. And, and yeah. he was the hatefulest man, you know. I was scared to death, and he was just so hateful. You know, you drive him somewhere, and he won't say a word, nothing. So the the old sergeant that I had he. He said, Don, do you like what? I said, hell no. He said, well, you know, he wants to get somebody else, a higher rank. And I I said, that's fine with me. So he put me in a motor pool. And I stayed there my whole year. And uh, I had a little office in the back of a a two-and-a-half-ton truck. And if somebody took a vehicle out of there, I had to ride it down. That was it. That was my job. Except (laughs) for guard duty, uh, Every two weeks, I had to go to the bunker line, which was the South China Sea. Ever, ever, I don't know, it might have been ever two or three hundred yards was a bunker, face the ocean. And over here is tree lines all the way around here, you know, 
trees, trees over here. And you had to go out there and sit all night. But, you know, I don't have no war stories. I was fine. Well, and, that's, that's good. Yeah, yeah, I don't have none of that yeah. stuff. I, uh, the worst thing I saw was uh, body bags on the flight line. Now, I, I yeah. didn't like that much. That's, uh, but uh, Vietnam, I was there. This Mike O'Neill uh, uh, sent me a, uh, a Rolling Stone. And on the cover was the band. You seen that cover? Yeah, yeah. And I said, "That ain't the damn band." Yeah, because all of a sudden they had beards and longer yeah. hair, and uh, yeah. well, I, you know, I knew that they. Uh, I didn't even know they weren't calling themselves the Hawks. Right. Yet. Right. This is 1967, uh, uh, the first part of '68. Yeah. In Vietnam, and the Rolling Stones, they're there on the cover. They got the beards and hair, and uh, I said, "That ain't the band," and it said that they had. Music from Big Pink was out. Yeah. And uh, so soon, as soon as I got home, I got that 8-track after I bought a 64 Corvette. <laughs> my mother, I sent all my money home, and she saved it for me. Well, that's, that and, uh, worked out well for you. But I put that CD in there, and I thought, what the hell is that? Yeah, because it's so different yeah, than what they've been doing before. Like it was that. night and day. I wanted yeah. to hear Love Light and all yeah. that. And I said, oh, hell, that ain't working. I don't like that at all. Yeah. And, that, and then uh, I listened to it a little more, and uh, I didn't become a fan for a while. Yeah. I, I was disappointed. I mean, heartbroken. And so was David. You know, we wanted to hear, we wanted to hear that, and then I listened to it a little more, and the, and and the weight, and and, the, and then finally I was hooked, and you know, I got the chance to see them in Nashville. They played Nashville without Robbie, and uh, it was uh, uh, Levon and Garth and uh, uh, Rick, and they had a guitar from uh, uh, Arkansas. Uh, he he played good. He played what was on the records. Yeah, and uh, had a another drummer. And when Levi would come out and play his man, and this other guy, and he was a good too. Yeah. And I, it was a, a they could get four or five hundred people in that building down on uh, second, and uh, it was just a concert kind of place, cement floor, no tables, none of that. And and my girlfriend, who has been my lifelong companion since then, uh, got me tickets. I was right down front, I mean right there. And uh, of course, Rick Dinkle was one of my favorites, being a bass player, and uh, LeVon. And, and that was a highlight there. So I got to yeah. see him twice. Yeah. So you get back from Vietnam, you get your Corvette, you listen to the band and stuff. So, and I'm assuming you get back into playing music. Yeah, I, I'm playing with a, a, a guy named Richard Young, another high school buddy, but he was a bass player. and. Uh, uh, he since passed away a couple of weeks ago, but a lifelong friend too. And uh, he said, now, you know, we, we could do a trio. I said, what, what are we going to do, two basses? Yeah. He said, no, you, you can play enough to get there. You can do this. So uh, I, uh, I borrowed it. I didn't have a guitar. I borrowed one. I, don't, I got a picture of that, but I don't know who I got it from. And we started playing the, these little clubs there in Wichita Falls. And we did that for a while. And uh, I'm trying to figure what was after that. I, I played with two or three other little bands, local, that played the military bases because yeah. we could always work. Well, I had a band with a, 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 a great B3, but his name was Hap Pendleton. And we had a trio. He played bass here. Right. So we, I, I was playing, still playing, if you want to call it, lead guitar. It's mostly the chords he showed me. <laughs> I don't know shit about music. Oh, excuse me. You're okay. Yeah. And anyway, we got a good little trick because he's a he's a great singer and he boy he can lay it in over here. In some way, he had that lower manual where he can run it through a bass amp, so it's kicking ass over there. Yeah, it's really punchy. And, yeah, and we and the drummer he's. He's passed away too. His name was James Hart. He played drums and harmonica. <laughs> I know. He kept the hi-hat going 
and the bass drum going and would just play the hell of a blues harmonica. And that's all we did, that old R&B stuff. Yeah, that's great. Well, Hap gets, uh, calls me on the phone. I'm standing at my mama's house. And he said, Don, he said, man, I, I, can't, I can't do this anymore. I said, what's the matter? Because we're doing pretty good with that little trip. It was called Flash. And he said, man, uh, uh, I played with this guy. We were just in Vietnam. I played with these guys uh, called Salt and Pepper. I said, Salt and Pepper. He said, yeah, they're an R&B duo, a black guy, a white guy, and a, a five-piece band. He said, and boy, they offered me a lot of money to come back on the road. Boy, I broke my heart. I was just getting home, and I was playing, and everything was going to get my hair growing out a little bit. Yeah. And uh, and he was on the phone with this uh, uh, lead singer. Uh, Bill Bagby was his name, black guy. Played every instrument on the bandstand and told you when you wasn't playing it right. He was an incredible musician and dance and sing. Uh, anyway, uh he calls uh, uh, Hap back and says, Hap, I need you to come, but uh, the bass player's leaving. Do you know any bass player? And by then, uh, so I'm getting ahead of myself again. Uh, after I first got home, Mike O'Neill calls me. He's playing with Jerry Don Fisher. Jerry Don Fisher is who they hired to take David Clayton, David Clayton Thomas's place with Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Right. You know, he got deported. Well, Jerry Fisher ended up in that band. Well, anyway, Fisher had a band called the Night Beats. It's another Hawks thing. Here's what they had. Jerry Don Fisher was the lead singer. Red-headed, freckle-faced guy from, he's from Texas, but he lived in Oklahoma City all his life. The best R&B singer I ever heard. Wow. The best. Anyway, he, he had a beat-through player Larry Judd Pierce played B3 left-handed bass. And he had uh, trumpet, tenor sax, and trombone. That's it. That's the band. No guitar, no bass. Incredible. Incredible wow. band. We followed them like we did the band. Everybody. And uh, I saw them in Dallas two or three times. Well, while I was in Vietnam, Mike O'Neill gets the guitar job. Still no bass. And uh, he sends me a letter right before I ETS out of the Army. Hey, I'm playing with Jerry Fisher. And I'm going, unbelievable. And uh, so I get home. I'm playing with Richard. And uh, we're doing the uh, club thing. And uh, Yeah, I got ahead of myself. I don't remember the order. That's and fine. he <laughs> He said, uh, boy, Bill Bagney says uh, that he needs a bass player. He said, I got to call him back. And I said, well, so you're going for sure? He said, yeah. And yeah, I ain't got a job. I'm living with my mom. I said, well, what do you think? He said, let me call him back. He calls him back and said, hey, Bill, I've got Jerry Fisher's bass player in here because I'd got the gig with Fisher. And Mike O'Neill calls me first and says, uh, uh, I'm, get, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting them backwards. I played with Fisher in the Night Beats before salt and pepper. That's what I'm getting backwards. Uh, uh, Mike O'Neill calls me and says, uh, Fisher's hiring a bass player and they're going to audition bass players in Dallas. I don't even have a bass. Richard Young's got a bass, <laughs> but, but I don't have one. So, and Richard's a big Jerry Fisher fan too. We all were. And uh, I said, I, I, I need a favor. And he said, what's that? I need to borrow your bass. And uh, him and Mike O'Neill, we all grew up together. And uh, he said, uh, what do you need to base for? I said, well, Mike called me and wants me to audition for Fisher. Boy, his face just dropped. Bless yeah. his heart. You know, because him and O'Neill are big friends, too. And he's a bass player. Yeah. And uh, he gave it to me. So I get in my Corvette. I drive to Dallas, Texas to a studio they had rented. And they're all ditching the bass players. I, I, I go in there and there's three bass players out in the hall, and I knew two of them. Monster. One of them's guy's name was Curly, 
And I'll never forget him. He, I said, well, this guy's got this. And what the hell am I even doing here? Yeah. But I had Ian, I had Michael Neal. Well, they had every, the whole band set up in, a, in the studio. And they're calling these guys in there one at a time. And uh, uh, after this curly, I went in an audition. I said, I was ready to go and go home. Well, they come, they come out there, this Larry the organ player, and he said, okay, Don, come on in, we'll play a couple. Well, I go in there and they pick two songs, and the two songs they pick, I knew of every one. One was uh, uh, Chicken Shack. You remember that old song? Yeah. Uh, old instrumental. I, I played that all my life with bands. And uh, uh, Chitlitz Car and Cardi was the other one. Yeah. They, they, I knew both those songs, you know, <laughs> and nothing else. But I... Uh, but I just I, I took a Richard's bass in there and uh, played those two songs and uh, went back out in the hallway. And uh, a few minutes, the organ player came out there and said, well, uh, how long would it take you to get your clothes ready? We're, we're going to Wisconsin uh, on Friday, and we'd like you to go with us. <laughs> and you got she, the gig. I, I didn't... I, I like to tore that Corvette up, get back to Wichita Falls and get in my clothes. And I went on the road with those guys. Uh, the organ player taught me those tunes on a melodica in a hotel room. Yeah. You know, you're looking at a guy that didn't know any music. You know, I, I didn't know any music. And uh, none. And he taught me. He would sit there in a motel room with that melodica. And he said, play this, Don. And, you know, and here's this line right here. And, and uh, Wow. But he taught me about, about Fisher's whole show in the motel room. And plus they had Mike O'Neill who helped me a lot. But I did that for two years and uh, Jerry Fisher got hepatitis and we are out of work. And uh, uh, me and O'Neill went with a, a, there was another R&B band called Sound Circus in Oklahoma. Monster, horns, really good band. The drummer had, uh, uh, kept the band together, and he wanted O'Neill and me out of Fisher's band. So I rehearsed with that band for a while. That fell through. And uh, uh, being with Jerry Fisher opened a lot of doors. When uh, You know, I knew everybody in Dallas. And uh, after Jerry Fisher, I was back in Wichita Falls, and... Uh, Hap gets the uh, the call from Salt and Pepper, and they need a bass player. So uh, Hap says, uh, "I got Jerry Fisher's old bass player," and the, uh, Bill said, "Bring him." So I go up there with Hap, load his uh, organ up, we uh, and we go go to Wisconsin, and then I've got to learn their show. They did two show sets and two dance sets. The band did the dance set. And Hap, you know, a great singer, knew all of that dance music, and I knew his music because I played with him. And uh, that was another horn band, uh, uh, trumpet and tenor sax. Well, Bill and, and Danny Handley was a white guy. There was a group called the uh, uh, Outsiders. Uh, they had a song called, a hit song called Time Won't Let Me. I think it was the Outsiders. He was the lead singer in that band. And then we got this pretty long-haired white boy and that uh, dancing fool black guy, and they do an hour show. And uh, we're back in them. I mean, they're doing uh, uh, Otis Redding and all that cool stuff, you know, fun to play, horn stuff. And then they, they set two makeup tables facing each other, you know, the lighted makeup table. Yeah. Then they come out, and they're in these white, tuxedo things, and uh, uh, they're facing each other. Well, they're singing somewhere there's a place for us, and the black guy's painting his face white, and the white guy's painting his face black, and the whole time they're singing this song. And then at the end of the song, they stand up, and they do this together. Yeah. And one of them is Black now, the other one's white now. Well, the people just go nuts over this show. So they stayed booked everywhere. Wow. And that was a fun band. And uh, 
uh, we go to the Caribbean Hilton in San Juan, Puerto Rico for three months. And uh, we're in the lounge and uh, uh, the main act room, Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. Okay. Yeah. And they got a barn burning Telecaster player in that band. So we, we're all, everybody's around there, and they come over to the lounge to hear us, and we go stand in the side and watch Frankie Valley. And uh, so the guitar player got to be friends with, uh, with everybody in the band, and uh, that was a great show. And uh, I got pictures of that. I should have bought some of them. Uh, but uh, that thing with uh, salt and pepper was a good thing. Well, they break up over there. And so here I'm stuck, married. I married a girl from uh, uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana. And uh, I'm, I'm married and no job. It's not a good place to be. <laughs> no, yeah. not at all. Well, the drummer in Salt and Pepper was from Tyler, Texas. Robin Hood Bryan Studios in Tyler, Texas. Okay. ZZ Top. Anyway... He said, Don, what are you going to do? I said, damn, I don't know. I have no idea. I've been, I, I'm not in touch with nobody in, anymore. I've been on the road for two years with them. So he says, hey, uh, I'm going to get a hold of Mouse. I said, uh, who's Mouse? He said, Mouse in the Traps. And then he said, Bug Sanderson. Why, well, right away, I knew who they were. Yeah. And uh, he said, you know, uh, David Stanley was a bass player in Mouse then. They had to shorten it to Mouse. And Bugs had moved on to Dallas and had the Bugs Henderson Trio. And uh, he said, well, you know, hell, they got a sit-down job right outside of Tyler, and it's, you know, it's 2 50 a week, five nights. I said, shit, sign me up. So uh, uh, I, I fly from Puerto Rico to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and that's where my wife lives at the time. And, uh, I, you know, I, I got very little money and no car. Her dad gives me his dad's 62 Buick that he never drove. He inherited. He said, Don, you can take this car down there, and when you get settled, I'll come and get it. So I pack her up. And we go to Tyler, Texas. I didn't know anybody but Nardo Murray. That's the drummer. And he is the character. This guy is a great drummer. And uh, 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 me playing with uh, uh, Jerry Fisher, who Mouse knew, and uh, Salt and Pepper, he also knew. He just took me. He said, bring him. Yeah. And it's the second job I got on somebody else's recommendation. So we get down there, and it's a pretty damn good band. And, uh, of course, I didn't know any of their stuff either. But Mouse, he takes me to his house and shows me everything I need to play. And David Stanley, i got to say something about this guy. He's one of the best uh, Fender bass players I ever heard. I mean, bass up here and just wears it out. He's a monster. But he moved to Dallas at that time. So I take that bass game, I play with Mouse. Well, we, we get the uh, big gasoline crunch. The came by, couldn't get gas. Right. So we couldn't get to Dallas to play. We couldn't get to Shreveport to play. Well, Joe Stampley's got a hit record. And Mouse played with him in the Uniques. You know, Joe had a rock and roll band. Yeah. Uh, and Mouse had been that guitar player for a while. So... He take Joe Snappy comes to see us with uh, uh, salt and pepper somewhere, and he said, well, "Bring Don, because his brother was his bass player, and for some reason he had to get off the road. I won't get into that. None of my yeah, business." Yeah. So Joe takes me, and uh, I play with Joe, me and Mouse, two guitar players. I had uh, Daryl Pewitt on guitar. He was 18 years old then from uh, East Tennessee, brought up bluegrass, but could play Chicago music, their horn lines on the Telecaster. Yeah. I have to say something about these guys because there's so many of them that you never heard of. Yeah. It's just a monster. So I mean, I, uh, 
I, uh, Mouse, you know, we need to take that gig. So me and, me and Mouse and Nardo were going to do a trio and try to make some money because, you know, I got a wife and a new baby by then. Corey, that was my son, who uh, now lives in Florida, where I live, in Gainesville, who built his hat at Dallas. I got to say that about my son. <laughs> he built me a house. A gift. What's that? Well, I brought you a diaper. Oh, hell, yeah, I could use that. <laughs> oh, well, I definitely got to have that. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. That's uh, great. Last time me and uh, uh, JD went fishing, he had got Jimmy Bond's album. Yeah. You remember yeah. that? Oh, yeah. Oh, let me yeah. your mic there so it's not. Oh, there I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. You're good. That's, the, the, that's everything he's ever done. That's amazing. On, on Thank CD. you very much. On I appreciate CD. that. And there's a... There's some cool shit in there, but there's a, a magazine with all his cars, too. Oh, yeah. It's really yeah. cool. So And his boots. And his boots. Yeah, right. But now... That's awesome. Yeah, right. I've actually been here the whole time. Yeah. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I mean, he's been, he's been I'm, trying, I'm trying to How remember you. <laughs> I'm great. <laughs> Have you really been here the whole time? Yep. I was in there. <laughs> <laughs> I've loved hearing it all. What's yeah. in the box? It's a Jimmy Vaughn box set. Yeah. Oh my God. So yeah, I got to hold this up and tell them about this. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's cool. Yeah. But yeah, but there's a, there's what it, it's cool. It looks like an old Fender amp, and there's five CDs in there. Okay. And there's even the first disc is stuff from even before the first Thunderbirds record. Really? And it's, you know, the original band, and it's just, you know, what can you say? Yeah, uh, yeah. This the is one. <laughs> It's no, I figured good. Doc Coke and Jimmy Vaughn, two things I know he'll love. <laughs> yeah, right. Get, getting to see the Hawks and getting to see uh, Stevie Ray twice, getting to see uh, uh, all of those great players from that area in Dallas and Fort Worth and Wichita Falls and Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. uh, people don't realize the music scene that, and right in that area, right there, right across the river from each other. Yeah. Lawton, Oklahoma, some of the best R&B bands in the world. Can Doing do the that. push. Yeah. Doing uh, the push. and uh, Just wanting to play that black music and, and, and could all good. play it. Good. Really good. Good to, good. good to see you too. Thanks. Man. Anyway, I just, I, had, I, I just, I knew I was going to come and try and surprise you. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, I just figured those are two things that, that 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 you wouldn't hate and that would oh, would be just fine. <laughs> so so you start playing with Joe Stampley, and so is that how you end up moving to Nashville? That, that's it. Uh, Joe had uh, several top ten, I think, a couple of number ones while I was with him, and uh, 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 Al Gallico was his manager, who uh, was. Really smart guy, I guess. Yeah. He got, uh, he saw something in Joe and tuck it up. Anyway, Joe said, "I, you know, guys, I'm moving to Nashville, and if you want to keep the gig, you, you got to move. Well, my wife's folks from Fort Wayne, Indiana. She is all about that. Yeah, you know, that's it, midways at least. Right. You're at least so, closer. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, I didn't want to, uh, uh, I wanted to play with Mouse, but there was no Mouse anymore. Yeah. You know, he quit Joe Stampley in Vegas. They had a little uh, falling out. I don't know what that was about. I, any, but you know, Mouse was my partner, boy. And he, the next one, he was up and gone. He got on an airplane and flew back to Tyler. And uh, of course, we had two guitar players, so we still played. But uh, you know, boy, I didn't know what to do when Mouse left. Yeah, because we were like, you know, we were like that every day with fishing or, or playing or, uh, Mouse is a character. Yeah, so tell me, tell me about you had you had really gotten into you know R and B music and you're playing bass and then all of a sudden you're playing with a you know a country artist and you're moving to Nashville, and that just seems like a certain level of a little bit of culture shock there. I, you know, it, well, I, I grew up from Texas. My mother, big Bob Wills fan, yeah. big time, and. And my mom and dad two step. And they loved uh, uh, country music, you know. I uh, I didn't like it I, at all back then. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a funny story. There's a a 
country singer. He's a legend in Wichita Falls, played around, and his name uh, bothers me. But we were run on to this guy in the music store. We'd all hang out, look at whatever was new. But he would come in there, and he he would come up to us, and he he wore those old baggy dress pants, you know. He'd have a pocket full of change in there, and, and he'd come up and rattle that chain in, and he'd say, you boys play some country music, you ought to have some of this too. <laughs> he made fun of all of us. <laughs> You'd be big time like yeah, me yeah. if you just did. You can't you just... get nowhere playing that crap. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you moved to Nashville. So, what year is this? Uh, I think seventy-five or six. Okay. And uh, uh, I moved here. I had a new baby. He was a, a little bitty guy, and uh, we got a little house out by the lake in Nashville. And uh, my work, she could get my wife. She could get a job anywhere. Yeah. And uh, she went to work and. Uh, I was gone from Thursday to Monday most of the time with Joe. He was hot. Yeah. You know, he, he and then the Mo and Joe thing was really going. Right. Mo Bandy. And, uh, yeah. And uh, when that hit, I, I got to do the Grand Ole Opry. And, uh, and once, one part, I got to sing uh, Mo's part on uh, some show. You know, when Mouse left, it, it just uh, wasn't the same. And, but this Daryl Puyett guy I tried to tell you about, he he was just a monster musician. Just one of them guys, if he could hear it, he could play it. Wow. You know, he was really good. And he, he turned out to be, a, he went back to school, and I think he's a school teacher. A big, East Tennessee boy. Great player. And Joe Stampley. I'm done with Joe Stampley, so I'm out of work again. And... Uh, <laughs> I'm thinking about uh, calling Mouse and going to Texas. I did a single downtown on Broadway yeah. for so Robert Moore, who yeah. at that time, the Merchant Hotel, you know where the Merchant yes. Restaurant, yeah. it was a hotel, a flea bag. <laughs> Robert Moore was the uh, manager. And again, this is the Robert Moore that you get the name Robert from. That's right. Okay. Yeah. But he didn't own nothing. He yeah. was just a manager and a bouncer, and he would bounce you. <laughs> anyway, but he liked me. He was a good man. Uh, uh, he knew who I was, and uh, uh, I was. Uh, so I, I just can't get the order right of yeah. things happening. There's so well, much. Let's let's just get up to the stagecoach then. You know, like, so you okay, so yeah. you, you kind of played a variety of yeah. of you know playing as a single okay. or, in, or in little groups, and so. So you, you get to the, the stagecoach, and, and, and Brent Mason's already in the band, correct? Yeah, it, it's, that's, that's where we have to start at. Uh, yeah. Mike Smith was okay. his name, the drummer. It was his gig. I, I'd met him down at Demon's Den, which was, here's a merchant hotel. Mm -hmm. Next door is a shotgun bar where everybody that had a road gig showed up to jam on Mondays because they would come in off the road on Sunday, all of them. Jimmy yeah. Dickens, you know, all of the, his band, uh, uh, Ernest Tubbs' band, all the time down at Demon's Den. Uh, I go, I stumbled in that club one night, and uh, uh, I was befriended by this uh, drummer who sings incredible. He lives in Oregon, name. his name's Mike Smith. Hell of a drummer and a Merle Haggard singing fool. Anyway, uh, one of the guys that was jamming that night Said, Don, come on up and sing. So I, I sang a Merle Haggard song. Well, when I got down, he came and said, Boy, I like that song. You did a good job on that song. And, and we became good friends. He he has a gig. I'm leaving out Gabe's and all of that stuff because we're trying to get to this. Yeah. He said, uh, What are you doing out? I, I, I was out of work. I said, Well, I'm thinking about going home. And he said, Well, I hate to hear you say that, he said, uh, I, I got a gig over there and the bass player's moving back to Texas. <laughs> he said, uh, it's a sit down gig and it's a lounge in a motel lounge. So this place seated, you might get 50, 60 people in there, period. Yeah. It's in a motel lounge. Yeah. There's an office here, here's a little lounge. 
So uh, he says, and you come out there and play it. It's two hundred fifty bucks, and you can work on Sundays if you want to. So I go down there, and uh, it's me, Brent Mason, uh, George Jones, old piano player, David Bird, monster, monster piano player, and. Uh, it just happened. It was good, you know. I had seen Brent out of Gabe's set in, and I knew who he was. Yeah. And, and uh, Mike Smith and Brent and David Bird. That was four of us. Yeah. And uh, is Brent still playing that Hagstrom Sweet uh, guitar? Piece of shit. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Hey, it's anyway, a Hagstrom. You can, you yeah, can say anyway, that. Anyway, yeah, he was. We're playing. Everything's going good. You know, it's it's really good. Well, Mike bless his heart, he he got into it with the club owner too. And and yeah. Mike Smith's a no nonsense. He don't he ain't taking nothing. He don't think he deserves. But uh, anyway, the the uh, club owner doesn't want him anymore. So he comes to me. I'd been there about three or four months. Well, I did this one old Waylon tune called Choking Kind. He loved that song. And every night I had to do it every set, every night. So he comes to me and he said, uh, Don, I'm, I'm letting Mike go. And I thought, what? Because yeah. this guy can sing his ass off behind the drums. Yeah. And a hell of a drummer. Anyway, he, uh, he said, now, I'll tell you what. You can keep who you want to and you can let go who you want to because this is your band. Well, I had no place to go. Now, yeah. I didn't like it because me and Mike was close. Yeah. And I felt bad about it. And uh, so I said, uh, well, I had, I had a friend called Paul Cook. Yeah, great drummer. <laughs> He's the, probably the best I ever heard. Jerry as Reed. far as uh, yeah. bass players, being a bass player, he's, he's the best I ever. Yeah. He had just phenomenal feel and like a freight train. I mean, you better keep up if you're going to play with Paul. Anyway, so I get Paul Cook. Boy, then the band is up another notch. It's Brent Mason, David Bird, playing an electric piano, which I liked, you know. Uh, I mean, that band was, people started hanging yeah. out. You know, it, it'd be full of musicians yeah. every night. So fate came into play in that by taking the original drummer out, who was doing a lot of the singing, yeah. all of a sudden it becomes your band all of a sudden, you you are pushed into the position of being the front man, and all of a sudden things start to to come into come into place. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and but I had Brent who can sing too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Brent's a good singer. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Anyway, but uh, we, we the thing that club owner and he had a lot to do with this. He he liked what I did, and. Uh, uh, he said, I just want you to do a couple of songs that are current. So we'd go out there and, and learn a Hank Jr. had, he was hot. So, yeah. you know, we, we, we learned all of that stuff. And, uh, uh, of course, Alabama, we did that stuff. And people loved it. But Brent could sing anything. David Bird, we get David Bird. You alluded to something, you know, before that that Brent Mason also when I when I spoke with him, he also said that there were just so many musicians that were coming out to the shows, oh, and he yeah. said that even Chet Atkins would come out and he would bring like George Benson. Now, that that or, was at the big stage shows. We okay. hadn't moved there yet. Okay, we're okay. still in that little old yes. fifty capacity lounge. Right, and uh, I mean musicians all over town. You know, uh -huh. back then Nashville. They had a house band in all these bars. Right. You know, that shit don't happen no more. No. And uh, there'd be house bands all over down the street, and all the Holiday Inns had four-piece bands. Six nights a week, seven nights a week. Right. And uh, the club owner comes to me, and, and uh, uh, he said, I'm going to buy another building right down the street. We're going to move. So uh, first, Dave Rowe brings... Paul Cook goes with uh, Ray Stevens. Okay. And uh, he'd already played with Jerry Reed and all that. He goes with Ray Stevens, and I'm out of drummer again. Uh, Dave Rowe had been coming in there, and he brings Artie in. They played together in Hawaii. Oh, wow. Yeah, I... and there was a, a 
Hawaiian lounges, you know, lounge acts, you know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I knew Dave Rowe, uh, not very well, but I knew Dave, and he brings Artie in. And uh, I, I forget, I think I'd, I let him sit in or I had him to come in on Sunday or something. But he played good, and uh, he sang good, sang high harmony. I mean, sing the lights out of it. So uh, we all uh, moved to the big stage coach. David Bird brings a full grand piano out of his house to the stagecoach. But, you know, David didn't last long after that. But in the meantime, all this happening, the club owner produces an album on me. And he lets David Bird produce it. Well, we go out to Hendersonville and do uh, uh, this album. Two or three songs I wrote. And, uh, he covers. takes the, yeah. Yeah, he, he, David Burr is married to Mary Lou Turner. All the duets you hear with uh, Whisper and Bill Anderson, okay. that's Mary Lou Turner on a couple okay. of the hits. Yeah. And he also had another lady sing with him. Anyway, Bird says, I, I'm going to get you a deal, man. I know them all. Yeah. So he, this club owner spends, I don't forget, seven, eight thousand dollars for this session. And, uh, I'm green as girl. I don't know anything about that. Yeah. I don't even want to do it. But, you know, everybody thinks, well, you know, one record and I could make some money. You know, I was just getting used yeah. to being out front and saying, do this, don't do that. Yeah. You, you were know. just learning how to be a front man. Yeah. And it sounds like this this album that you were creating, was that something more to have, have stuff to sell at the at the show? No, I thought like I was going to be a star. Okay. But so, but then, then you were thinking, this is kind of like a, this is to help me get a deal. That's, right. Okay. Okay. Right. I got you. So I go out there and do it, and I, I'm embarrassed. I, I don't like what I did, but they did it, and they used a couple of a steel player that was a session player and a guitar player. I don't remember the names because I never cared for what they did, so I don't remember. But uh, uh, I didn't hear nobody. He he pitched that album. He said. And, and didn't get no, uh, uh, didn't shake no bushes, I guess. Nobody wanted it or whatever. And so I forgot about it. Well, he, he leaves the band. So I get uh, Paul Hollowell. He, uh, he played with me for a while. And uh, I had Drew Sexton on keyboard. He passed away, bless his heart. He and David Berg are from Oneida, Tennessee. Okay. The gospel piano players, <laughs> monster, both of them. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, it was me and Brent, and uh, Brent wanted me to quit playing bass and get Jimmy Carter. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he said, Don, Jimmy plays fiddle. Boy, I said, all right. You know, so I get Jimmy Carter, and he can play fiddle, but he don't like play fiddle. Jimmy's a, a real laid back guy. You know, he don't he don't step up. He's not he's just real polite and real laid back, but a great musician. So I got Jimmy Carter on bass. I'm playing acoustic guitar. Uh, and uh Artie on drums and Drew Sexton on piano. Man, that's a hell of a band right there. Yeah. But we're doing covers. Yeah. You know. And 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 so so Brent was the reason that you switched from bass to to guitar. Well, not, no, I'm not blaming Dan him. I, no, no, no. But, I, but I, I, I want to stand up front. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't want to be stuck on the bass. You can't make no mistakes in the bass. <laughs> you know, you, and you, can't, <laughs> you can't talk and yell and 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 talk to the to the crowd and and play bass at the same time. It's hard. You, yeah. you know, I could drop the acoustic guitar a couple because nobody knows. Right. Yeah. So I did that, and Jimmy Carter. Was, he brought a lot to the ball game. He was such a monster, but you know this thing here was in. Oh, the slapping and popping. Oh, I hated yeah. that shit. Yeah, because I couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like that. Yeah, that was a symbol. But boy, he could wear it out. Yeah. And him and Brent, they did Billy's Bounce, and uh, they twinned it. Wow. He played that on the bass, and then we did Devil Went Down to Georgia. He played the fiddle. Well, we didn't lose nothing because 
I would I had a bass. I kept it set up. Yeah. Anytime Jimmy played the fiddle, I played bass. All yeah, the bass. Uh, four four shuffle things, Jimmy kicked them off. Hard over mine, all of that old good Ray Price stuff. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and people loved it. They're two stepping their ass off around that little. Yeah, club. people love the fiddle. But Jimmy's on... not a six not a weaker. He didn't like that. And plus, he was getting a few sessions. Yeah, because of his great steel player, his brother Gary Carter plays yeah. with uh, Marty Stewart and Marty's wife. Yes, but uh, uh, after uh, Jimmy uh, left. I got another great singer, uh, Rod Ham. Yeah. Uh, from uh, uh, he played with the Cats, Nashville Cats. Wow, Rod Ham, great band, and uh, he's singing like a bird, boy. And uh, he played in a band about a good year, year and a half, and then I'm starting to switch guitar players. Right. This this is a great story. Uh, Larry Lee, Mel Tillis' bass player, was he's hanging out at the stagecoach. He loved Brent, loved Brent. And he got to be a big whip because he managed Lee Greenwood. Okay. He heard Lee Greenwood in Vegas and got him to come to Nashville. So he, he got big time. Well, he, all the demo session stuff, he said, man, we got to get this Brent Mason. So Brent starts getting this work from Larry. I mean, he's working every day and then playing every night. Yeah. Uh, well, that didn't sit too well with his wife. So Brent, uh, uh, he had to quit. You know, he couldn't do both and, and keep his uh, family life together, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so, and and I, I want you to hit upon, you know, because this story's been told a bunch, but, I mean, there's the story of how, you know. The, he, the guitar. The, the guitar, just in what, what's your side of the story in that? Yeah, like, I, 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 I don't remember like he did. I had that guitar uh, first. I was using it on Sunday nights. Yeah. And because uh, uh, I played guitar on Sunday night, and I think I had uh, Becky Henson playing bass and singing with me. I think that, I don't know, she didn't know more moment than me. And uh, we, we had another piano player, and... God forbid I can't think of his name because he was another monster. Oh. Yeah, but I just can't think you've, of him. You've done great. So, yeah, I mean, you've, uh, you've uh, rattled off a million but names. But there's so. one thing about yeah. this guy i got to say. He played electric wordless piano, the one with the reeds. Yeah. He put a five-string banjo on top of it. In the middle of truck driving, man, he quits playing piano and picks up the banjo <laughs> and just burned it. And he worked for a little while at the little stagecoach, me yeah. and Becky. Well, I'm playing that old silver guitar. Brent's playing that piece of sh the Hagstrom. Yes, and, the piece uh, of Hagstrom. Yeah. And I, 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 I said, man, you, you, you need to get a Fender guitar, man. I, you're a wonderful player, but you know, this ain't gonna take you nowhere. You got to get a Telecaster. And, uh, and so he's, I think he started using mine. Yeah. And he finally he used it more and more. Well. I found a bass I wanted out at, uh, uh, there was a music store in town, there was five of them. They were everywhere. Uh, Hughley's. Hughley's, yeah. Hughley's. Hughley's, yes. And I was out there, and they had a uh, uh, a real old p uh, jazz bass, I think. Oh, I wanted it. Yeah. And uh, the only way I could get them was trade, and I didn't have the money to have both. And I told Brent, I'm taking this out to trade it. You better get it. And if I remember right, I traded that bass in, and he got it that way. But he remembers it different. Yeah, well, yeah. And, and it matters not to me. Yeah. Because that, right. look where it took him. That's right. But, I, I mean, it was almost a, you either had a telecaster or you don't work. You know, that was just part of it. So, and it made a difference in its oh, sound. Oh, hell, ability. it was yeah. an incredible difference. And it was stuck, you know, just like it came. Yeah, it didn't have all the extra junk oh, on it. Oh, no, it didn't. Yeah. The metal pickup or the humbucker. <laughs> <laughs> for, for, for those of y'all in, uh, in, in TV land, he's uh, staring down uh, Luke, uh, you know. <laughs> Wait till I get to his story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's going to. Or his. <laughs> or Joe's. Yeah, anyway. Okay. 
Yeah. So, so boy, Brent, the Brent, yeah. when he got that guitar, it was daylight and difference. Yeah. Man, it was, I think he had a twin reverb. He's too damn loud. He's always too loud. Yeah. They all are. <laughs> and me included. Yeah. And, and you know, there's no tone in a fender amp if you don't crank it. Yeah. I don't care if it's a little one or a big one. Yeah. <laughs> so, boy, I mean, we, we had, uh, at that time, we had Paul Cook and, and Brent and, and, uh, David, no, we we didn't have David Bird. And we we're already at the big stagecoach, so yeah. Paul Cook was gone. We'd raised David had already, but uh, and we were doing the top forty stuff, whatever's out there. Yeah. And but I never let go of uh, the stuff I did before Joe Stanton come on the truck driving man. Uh, everybody's talking that old song. Uh, yeah. And ever more a Hager song in the world. And back then I had a little bit of that old. Texas edge in my voice. It's been gone for years from work, but you know, people like that, them tunes, and, and we didn't do them like the record. I mean, you had to play the signature licks, but when it's your time to solo, yeah. you bet it's time to say something. And boy, you didn't have to beg none of them. Yeah. And Brent, man, he just was, and then turn around and do uh, uh, George Benson. The first time I heard him scat over the microphone, I was going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, uh, it was a really a good man, Drew Sexton. He played bluegrass, but he played his solos with one finger. I mean, he's this kind of piano player, but yeah. that bass line up your ass, yeah. and, you know. But when he's doing the bluegrass, he's like a, like, yeah, like a damn guitar player. <laughs> but he, uh, I mean, you couldn't lose Drew Sexton. He yeah. was right there. Yeah. Another sing like a bird guy. Yeah. One, one thing you hit upon, you, you, uh, you were saying Brent and like a twin reverb. So that's, so at some point in here, I, I hope we're, we're able to get upon how much that, uh, you know, where your repertoire starts kind of coming together as far as the song choices. And then also, how you would tell guitar players like, you know, that amp's too loud, or you know, or you get get the get the right amp or tone, because yeah, you've always been into tone. Well, if I get any flack from the the guy we're working with, who's paying the bills, you know, if it yeah. gets too loud, you know, and it was always too loud, but you know, I wasn't going to sacrifice too much. Yeah. You know, if it don't sound good to me, it don't sound good to anybody else, and and it, me being around. The Michael Neils and the Bugs Hendersons and Ronnie Weiss and Mouse and uh, you know, you know you you either going to have a crowded club that come to hear these guys play, or you're going to have a shit band and you ain't going to make no money. And neither am I. Yeah. And Lower Broadway's completely different from the stagecoach. Now we didn't have a tip jug. Right. To, to stagecoach, you know. How does how does the kind of the the Telecaster and and kind of Fender amp kind of become the the model of of what you kind of push the guys toward just like you did kind of with Brent and others that that, that kind of becomes uh, the idea that, that would be with all the way back to this guy yeah yeah he the first thing he got was a sixty first good guitar he got was a a sixty two or three Stratocaster yeah and uh, we saw Robbie Robinson he yeah. had a Telecaster right. So he traded that some bitch in the next day, I guess. He got a Telecaster. Yeah. And uh, everybody was going to him. Nashville, they were going to him too. Uh, yeah. Uh, the chicken picking, uh, uh, that all started. Uh, uh, you know, Roy Buchanan, those guys, they, you know, they took that Telecaster. Yeah. And. Uh, but like like a guy like, like JD when when he joined up the band he had like Dr. Z amps and stuff like that and yeah. you kind of said hey you know let's yeah. get a, get a Fender yeah he he went to see Red in Austin yeah and he went to that little music store and he bought that Deluxe Reverb yeah and when he came back there was it was a no brainer man and he quit using a lot of gadgets yeah because you turned that something but you didn't need it yeah. Uh, J.D. is a monster tone guy, yeah, ain't, ain't no doubt about that. And Copycat over here <laughs> is a monster tone guy too. Yes, he you is. You know, he, he yes. paid attention. 
Yes. When we get to him, I got I yeah. got to tell you that yeah. story. So okay, so let's get back kind of in the timeline. So so Brent leaves, and then you, you start. Oh, you start here's having, a guy. Yeah. The, the next guy come. All right, uh, Barbara Mandrell. She had a car wreck. Oh yeah. Yeah, a year she was off. She had a guitar player from Richmond, Virginia, named Sid Hudson. Yeah. Bebop fool, but he also loved country music. He played steel guitar in Telecaster. He played steel guitar with a flat pick. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. So he said, he got, Brent's leaving, and I've heard Sid a million times. And I said, Sid, you yeah. know, we need somebody to play uh, guitar and steel. Okay, he jumped on you. He didn't have a job either. And uh, he, he was a monster, man. He just chicken pick, burn that. Uh, burn any kind of jazzy song. I mean, him and Brent, the beboppers. I mean, rip it. Yeah. And then pick the flat pick up and play steel guitar, like Lord Green music. Yeah, he was a mind. He didn't last but a year. Him and Artie didn't get along too good. And uh, when Artie don't like somebody, there's something wrong with them. Yeah. And uh, uh, they had a little falling out, so had to let him slide. But Brent leaving, uh, that was downhill for a while. Hmm. I forget who was next. Uh, there was three or four that don't matter. Yeah. And I, and I don't say anything. They're all better players than me, and yeah. I'm not, but they didn't matter to me. So who, who's the next one that comes along that really uh, that uh, really? I had a kid called uh, Gary Don Smith. Okay. He's from Louisiana. He was, hey, he might have been 18 or 19. Paul, he was a rip rowing monster. Telecaster, he's from Louisiana. He sing, uh, he loved Texas swing, he loved roly polies and, th and that kind of music, but he was a blues freak just like me and could just burn it. He, he was wonderful, but he, I don't know if he drank he drank too much. I, I don't know even what happened to him, but. Uh, he, he had a little trouble with his girlfriend, who was a waitress there, and they didn't want him around anymore. Yeah. So I had to replace him. The next one that really makes me uh, think a lot of was uh, Walter Garland. Uh, he's from California. He's, he graduated from that guitar school. What is the uh, big... G-I-T. Yeah, yeah. Big, big into that. Another monster guy. Uh, incredible. He played, and well, I love this guy, and, and a great guy. But uh, he got a chance to go with a star that had number one records, and he I don't know what happened to him. He moved. And I'm trying to think who's next. <laughs> Troy Lancaster played. Yeah. A good guitar player. Real good. Uh, another one. Anyway, let's move on to the singer's night at the state coach. And I, I think it was on Wednesday, so this means a, a jam session, singer night combined. Yeah. So what we did, we played the first set, and then we would get anybody up that wanted to play. Yeah, because, it, yeah. Because if you knew yes. all, of the, all of the happening now girl songs, you could play. Yeah. Because we wanted down. Yeah. And we did the first set, and we had... A couple of bass players that knew every damn one of them, bingo, yeah. we got them up right then. Right. And they stayed. So all the, all the, all the girls could come up and, do, and, and, and do, sing their... Call out Patsy Cline and they right. could play it. Right. And the same with the guitar player. And uh, it used to be a fight to see who could get down first. Yeah. Because I was always first because I'm the MC. <laughs> you know, I'm out of there. Yeah. Because uh, then you can have a drink or you can just hang out. Yeah, <laughs> but you had to kind of sign up to be to pull, get up and play, no matter who was singing, you yeah. could play. So Red Volkart comes in there, and uh, he's fresh from Texas. He spent some time, and he left California. Well, you know that story. Yeah, yeah, he was in Canada, yeah. he goes out to California, now, he, he goes to Texas. he remembers this different to me. Yeah. No, I want to hear your version. Uh, well, uh, he comes in there, and he and he, uh, he signs up, or, or let me know that he wanted to, and he's sitting way at the back of the room. He's sitting there by himself. And I go through everybody, 
And it's the last set, you know. And to be honest, I did kind of forget about it. But uh, I'm real critical, you know, when I first meet somebody. You know, people that ask to sit in, normally I don't, you know, I yeah. don't fool with it. But anyway, he's sitting back there, and I, I felt bad. We had to get back up there, the whole band, because everybody was done. We get back up, we're doing this last set. And I see him sitting back there, and I thought, God damn, I got to get this guy. Yeah, he stayed here the whole night. Yeah, yeah. he's been there waiting. Yeah. yeah. And uh, later on, I felt real bad. I apologized. But I got him up there, and uh, he's got a, it's a Telecaster, but it's a, uh, was it Memphis St. Blues? St. Blues, yeah. It's a St. Blues Telecaster. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was and I, I looked down and thought, oh, shit. <laughs> And, but, <laughs> that ain't no fender. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, I asked him, I said, uh, is, is there anything that you want to do? He said, yeah, just whatever. So I think I started off with truck driving, man. I mean, burned it. <laughs> oh, man. He steps up there, and me and Art are going, are you kidding? Because <laughs> here's this, you know, Red haired, kind of round fellow, and, oh and my just killing God. it. Oh my God, he yeah. just ripped it off. And I need to get top player. Gary has gone. Yeah. You know, I'm using subs. And I forget the songs that we did. It's been so long, but uh, I say, man, this is ridiculous yeah. to find this guy. And you you can't name a song he can play. And if you want to do a blue shuffle, he can play that too. Yeah. Uh, it, it just it was incredible. Yeah, he did. And he, friend, I just asked him at the end. I said, "Man, you want a gig? It's here." Yeah. I forgot what they made. They made two fifty or something like that. And you know? and you could work on Sunday. Uh, but boy, we were locked in, and we both liked everything. We loved music stores and pawn shops. And uh, Mexican food. Yeah. So we palled around every day, me and Rick. Yeah. And uh, so at this point, is the is the band coming down to a quartet to four guys at this point? Is there still like a five piece with a piano player? Or you, you know, because I was wondering when it kind of comes down to like oh, the we classic. Oh, we got woman. to Clint Gregory. Oh, okay. Yeah, cause, and that's that. Red went off and played with him. Yeah, yeah. Red. Yeah, I had. Uh, uh, Billy, another fiddle player for a while, but he didn't sing and he, he didn't play guitar. But he left to go with somebody, I guess. I, his name was, I can't think of the name, he passed away too, bless his heart. And, but uh, it was uh, going to be Sean Camp or Clinton. Yeah. And they both sat in to play for me. Yeah. I uh, wish I'd have took Sean Camp, but I didn't. I, I got Clinton, who? I didn't know, but it had a a light record deal with some small label. Right. And uh, they had done an album on it. Great singer, great fiddle player. And that's all I'll say about that. But uh, uh, he got that deal, and they the record label gave him a bus. He had a chart record. Yeah. And uh, he takes uh, Red and... Uh, Kevin Grant. Oh, yeah. I know Kevin. And, uh, Bass player. Uh, for his road band. So who did I get after Red? It'd be like uh, Danny Parks or who? Danny Parks. Okay. That's right. Danny Parks plays fiddle. That's yeah. why I hired him. But Danny Parks didn't like to play fiddle. He wanted to play the Telecaster. Yeah. That he got Joe Glazer to build that had EMG pickups in it. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't like the sound of that? Not at yeah. all. They're real, real no, crisp high end. No yeah. Fender amp. He had a power amp. Yeah. And two high dollar monitors. Yeah. Sitting on the floor. Wrong. Wrong. <laughs> but I love Danny Parks. He's a great yeah. musician. Don't get me wrong. Yes. But that wasn't working for me at all. And uh, I don't know. Dan Danny started doing a lot of demos and stuff. And so... Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know who I got after that. I think it did. Uh, hell, I don't know. Yeah, but this is another little interesting side thing. So you've, you've kind of got I, strong ideas about, about tone, about pickups, about where, 
where the speakers are placed, all sorts of things. Oh, I, yeah. absolutely the best. Yeah. I, yeah. So, so you wanted amps off the floor. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I even got on Brent's ass about the PV amps. <laughs> but then I got me one. <laughs> <laughs> so you, at first you didn't like the PV amps. With oh, them. hell so, no. So why? And, yeah. yeah. And when I was with Joe Stampy, I had a, a amp deal with, uh, what is that other amp? Uh, God, it was on my tongue. But they gave us all amps. And then when I left Joe Stampy, they took it back. <laughs> <laughs> So, and you wanted you wanted the guitar players to get their amps off the floor? Is that well, yeah, part of well, it? Well, not so much that, but yeah, that'd be a Fender amp. I didn't want to hear yeah. that. Yeah. You know, and and uh, battery-driven pickups. What the hell yeah. are they thinking? <laughs> God almighty. Yeah. So, so Danny Parks, play, does does Red come back? Or, uh, so what, what happens, you know? Oh, Red comes back later on. Yeah. Yeah. Rick comes back twice. Yeah. After that, and I also heard that you that you fired him at uh, least once. <laughs> well, you want to say why I, you fired him? I never, bless his heart. I never forget to look at that. It, yeah, it was a. Uh, I won't tell what happened, but uh, I was either going to lose two guys that stuck with me when it was nothing. Yeah. Or Red had to go. It yeah. was one of those kind of deals. But everybody's all made up and yeah. forgot about but it. Yeah, it was all yeah. worked out, and he came back again. Yeah, and uh, uh, he played with somebody after Clint Gregg. It was just, uh, anyway, yeah. Red uh, didn't uh, stay with that long. And uh, he came back at, at a little place. It was a basement called, what was the name of it? Buckboard, that's it. Okay. He was in the bottom of a building out on Donaldson Pike. And uh, first I had Rod Riley. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, and, uh, or did I get Rod after? <laughs> I get a little hazy. This ain't in that. This is yeah. not funny. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all supposed to be helping. <laughs> <laughs> the peanut gallery is supposed to be helping. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I, Rod Riley. Uh, I had another little guitar player, a great little Telecaster player. I can't think of his name either. But he was uh, trying to date one of the waitresses at uh, Bugboard, and Cost they the got in an argument, and the clubber said, I can't have that. He's gone. Yeah. And uh, I got Rod Riley. And uh, Rod was going to play steel guitar and, and electric guitar. Well, he gets a Vernon Gosden gig. So I'm out get a car. I call Red back. Yeah. <laughs> Red comes back and we go to Gabe's. Yeah. And, and Gabe's was uh, kind of a rough place. Yeah. Uh, there, St Gabe's was like the Demons Den downtown. Uh, uh, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, it was like a jam thing. You know, yeah. all the road bands, there'd be three steel guitar players set up on the dance floor. Wow. Yeah. Great places. Yeah. You know, it's not like that no more. Yeah. Yeah, if you need a musician, just go hang out with them jam session. Yeah, you'd find you'd find somebody yeah, that you like. Great ones. Yeah. So yeah, Red, but Red Red came back and yeah. uh, we and, were out at Gabe's. Yeah. And, and and when when are we coming down to like the 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 format of the four piece band of you fronting a bass player, drummer, well, right, and electric we're, player? Really, we were the first one was four piece. Me and Brent right. and and, uh, and Bird and Paul Cook. Yeah, that was it. That was the one yeah. of my favorite bands. Yeah, it might my, my most favorite. And David Bird was such a soulful piano player. Yeah, you know, he grew up in the Pentecostal home just like I did. Boy, he just banged that left hand. You know, you knew Bird was there. That's for sure. And when he left, I got Drew Sexton, and he's another one. Yeah, they grew up in the same town, Oneida, Tennessee. Wow. So you get get red. Uh, so and and you and Red are going to Mexican food places and pawn oh. shops and, <laughs> yeah. and picking up, trying to find old Telecasters and stuff oh, like that. Oh, we were like pawn shopping every day. And back it was there was no internet to tell these guys what they had. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. Uh, well, so. I bought some great stuff. So did he. Yeah. He's still the king. He is. He to this day, he still he's somehow finds he, all sorts of crazy stuff. I ain't gonna tell you stuff. about his last deal, but I talked to him last week. Yeah. <laughs> he won't, he don't want me to share that. He, he had two two black guards. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, you yeah. know about it. I know about that. I don't know the 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 money, but I know that he got oh, two black man. guards. He, yeah. 
He's the king of it. Yeah. He's the king of it, but ain't no doubt about that. Yeah, so, but uh, Red and I, you know, uh, he's just a character, yeah. you know, and it shows in his play. Yeah. And everybody's got to have something. Yeah. It's funny how much people's uh, character comes out in their playing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They can have, be all the character want to as long as they do what I ask them to do. <laughs> you know? So yeah, that's the easiest gig in the world. You come yeah. down there and you do what I ask you to do yeah. at first, and then get your money. You're gonna have the best. You're gonna get to play more than you ever played in your life. That's right. You're gonna be ten times the musician when you leave this band, yeah. and you're gonna make more money than anybody on the street. Yes. Let's 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 hit on this. So. You start getting, you know, you have some players that are kind of more fully formed, but then you start getting some of the younger players that you're kind of acting like a coach for, and you're and 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 they're getting to play, they're getting instruction. Oh, from the you. old guys got coached too. <laughs> so how did you coach them? I what just, you, coach you know, if I didn't like something, I told them. Yeah. Do this. Don't do that. Yeah. You know. Would you give them the stink eye? I just tell them. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Would you tell them during the song? No, after. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you you start you start getting these players and and you're telling them what you want and they're getting the chance to play. Oh man! You know, four or five nights a week for like four hours. I mean, there's nothing better for your playing. I tell I mean, you what. Two weeks after JD got there, he was burning. Yeah. Burned it because I I knew him. I was playing with him before he played with you. Oh really? And so, yeah, and so I kind of helped him move to town. Yeah. And so when he was trying to get a deal, and I was playing in his band. So Dave Rowe played on his yes, session. Yes, that's right. I played with Dave, and we had done some some showcases and stuff for labels, and and everybody passed on him because he was he was out there because yeah. he was he was all over the place wearing a rhinestone suit and everything, and so then. But he liked Pete Anderson. He did. Yeah. So, but the thing that happened was, is that, uh, you know, of course, you know, he's told the story of how, you know, he was, you know, out of money and stuff. And, and so he starts playing with you and he keeps telling, JD keeps calling me and he said, hey, come out and see me play with Don. And I'm like, eh, whatever. I just didn't think any, you know, because it was like, JD's this, you know, I've, you know, I played with him and stuff. And he was, he was the guy that's on the floor playing with his teeth and doing all this crazy stuff. And I was like, I, you know. He's like, I, I love you, buddy, but I, you know. Yeah. And so finally, he kept saying, and finally it got to the point where it was awkward. And I was like, okay, I'm going down to Roberts. I'm going to go see, see play, you know, yeah. with you. And he was so much better. And he had learned how to control that energy that he had. Yeah, he right. was able to focus it and those solos. Do and his where it tone, counts. Yeah. And instead of just playing crazy loud and with a bunch of pedals, he just had a telly and a deluxe. Yeah. And, he sounded amazing, oh, and it was yeah. like the difference of your coaching and everything. He uh, just nailed it, boy. Uh, uh, you know, I, I tell him, uh, uh, you know, you know, we got two guitars, bass, and drums. Somebody got to step up. You yeah. Know, when it's your turn. Yeah. You know, and Red Volkart, you know, you give him two or three solos, he's going to play the first one in, in the front position. Yeah. And he gets a second one. He's gonna go to the back. It's time to play. And he's, yeah, he's right. gonna he's gonna yeah. Really... He'll noodle around a little bit up here with a little bit of a uh, few chords here and a little little jazzier yeah, western swing type thing. Yeah, a little bit thing. of that uh, yeah. shit I don't want to hear. And then yeah. flip it on the back pickup where, where you where you want to been the whole where time. Been the whole time. <laughs> All right. So uh, so after Red, we get to Johnny Highland. Oh yeah. Oh Johnny Highland. Uh, uh, I didn't know Red was even leaving yet. You know, he uh, uh, on the corner across the street there where Rippy's is. There was two old bars. Yeah, Sh terrible places. And I, uh, I'd go to work early and go listen to some people. You know, and uh, it was in the summertime, and I, I was walking uh, down the street and uh, right over across, across over the Rippy's, and I was walking by there, and I heard this. Solo, boy, <laughs> burning that thing, and it sounded like uh, Ricky Skaggs, uh, Ray Flack stuff, yeah. and that's what it was. Yeah, and uh, and I, I stood by the window, and, 
there's this little uh, pudgy kid uh, playing a Telecaster. And, uh, um, I thought, man, that kid can play. So uh, they played there in the afternoon. Well, uh, a couple of days after that, I'd see him. You walk in Roberts, there was a bench there. And uh, he would be sitting there, Johnny would be sitting there. And Red's playing, and he's yeah. looking straight ahead. You know, and uh, I think I asked whoever was playing me, maybe it was, uh, uh, it was Ronnie. Uh, I, I asked him, uh, uh, Ronnie, you know him? He said, no, I don't know him. So a couple of days later, come back by, there's there. So he got through with playing on a song, and I, I went like that. Yeah. He didn't even look at me. Right. I thought, what the hell? So yeah. then one time he was back in there, and uh, uh, I asked the bass player was a friend of his. They moved here together. Sid, and he passed away too. Anyway, I asked Sid, I said, what the hell's wrong with him? You know, I, he said, Don, he can't see you. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, I felt about that yeah. big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, I used him, I think, uh, when Red flew out to audition for for Merle, I think I used Johnny. It was a no-brainer. Yeah, he just fit in. Yeah, he just burned it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just burned it. He's something. Yeah, and one thing we need, I feel like we need to hit on here is that all the time that you're playing from from the beginning up all these guitar players stars singers all these people are coming and seeing y'all play yeah right yeah the whole well, time not to see me yeah, they're well, coming well but they're, yeah. they're coming they're coming for the whole show yeah but you know so you've got you know like like jd had talked about like you know reggie young and james burton and all these different people coming and and you've got all these people coming and see, there, there's so there's there's some pressure there's you know there's some stars uh, no, and, no, i didn't give a shit about none yeah. of them <laughs> no, I don't care about them people. Yeah, at all. You know, people that come and ask you to get them up because their friends are with them. Yeah, I ain't giving. I ain't letting them up there. And the ones that that that'll come up to you and give you their card and say, "Man, I can do everything he can do." I've had that I, a number of times. Right. What does that t What does that tell you? I don't want him in my band. All right. Hey, you need to hear my son play. Yeah. He can do that. Um, so, so that that brings up kind of an interesting little side question. So, you know, you're always got you know band members coming and going to a degree, and especially in the in the guitar slot. So, you know, are, are you always kind of keeping files of like, hey, so and so is good. If something happens to Red, you know, so how did that kind of? Because you're not t letting people sit in, and you're not taking people's business cards. So, but you're just observing different guys playing, and yeah, you kind of just I, I just hung out early on Little Broadway, yeah. You know, and uh, I just did uh, what I thought would make everybody a little money, yeah, and get to play with people that could play, yeah. And uh, you know, if I made somebody mad over this little interview, I don't care. You know, I, yeah. I didn't name their names. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't want nobody to do it to me. Yeah. But uh, there's some people that uh, they just didn't do what I needed. To, you know, I, I'm gonna have to stand up there with him four hours a night every yeah. day. Yeah. You know, it's, I was working seven days. I, yeah. I had a different band on Sunday. It's your gig. Well, I, don't, yeah. I just wanted to keep it. Yeah. You know, and it was working so far, so I wasn't gonna change nothing. Yeah. But the, these people that come back, these uh, players, and here's what they look like. They're standing by the bar. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, me and, me and Joe, we wreck them right off, you know. Yeah. When I, when I, here's what they do. Every night. I mean, so Joe and I started calling them out. Yeah. We'd point at them, you know. And uh, those two that we did that to, they never came back. You know, yeah. we ever saw them again. Because there's there's people that will talk big or think big about themselves, but well, yeah. yeah, and you how you gonna run down somebody like that and, and that? Yeah. Come on, you know, grow up. Yeah. And yeah, I know I have no patience for that. 
So Johnny Highland's in the band. Oh, man. Yeah. That was a no-brainer right there because he knew every Red Volkart lick in the world. Because Red had kind of mentored him a little bit. You yeah, know? well, yeah. I don't think they were buddies. I don't okay. know. But uh, Johnny here one time, he can play it. Yeah. yeah. I don't They might have been hanging out of hell. I don't know. Yeah. But Johnny Highland was, he took it a notch up too. Yeah. He brought a little, uh, uh, little pudgy blanket that could eat that telecaster up. Yeah. And he can play everything else too. Yeah. yeah Johnny is one of a kind, and so is Red. So is Brent. You've had, yeah, you've had a bunch of one of a kinds. Yeah. So then I guess. So is JD. Yeah. yeah. They all brought something. Yeah. And I kept it. You know. Yeah. You know, you, you got to step up like JD. Yeah. You got to play like Red. You got to be humble like Johnny, you know, all of those things. See, that's interesting that that you're, you know, you're showing how the players that came through the band they changed you and they changed how you led and they changed what you wanted from the in the guitar position. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if I give anybody advice, never ever retire. I don't give a damn if they roll you to the gig in a wheelchair. Do not do it, because you would damn sure regret it. And, but, you know, that uh, I, I didn't want to be sick. Yeah. You know, being 75 years old at that time, well, 74, uh, uh, I didn't want to go back down there. I mean, I wanted to go down there. Yeah. But I knew if I did, I might not, you know, I don't drink, don't smoke, never have, and I'm in pretty good shape. I probably would have been all right. But everybody down there got it. Yeah. When these guys went back, they got sick. Yeah. And uh, I already had that. My son had, bless his heart, he built his daddy a house in a 60 uh, uh, year and older com- neighborhood. You got to be, to buy a property, you got to be 60 years older. And my son found that house. He took it from the subfloor to the roof. It's brand new, it's, everything's paid for, you know. And I thought, boy, you know, you could probably do this a couple more years and and not embarrass yourself, but eh, it's time to go. Yeah. So I sold my house in White House, and three days later, I was gone. But back to Johnny Hyde. Yeah. So you, you had, so so Johnny, you know, brought his own, you know, in, intensity, and then and then you uh, you get up to Guthrie Trap. And, you know, okay, this is a good story okay. here. Okay, tell us. Yeah, that's a good one here. I, uh, I've been seeing Guthrie on Sunday nights. I've been, I had a Sunday night band, me and Porter, me on bass, which was my all-time favorite instrument, you know, yeah. guitar. So I could stand up front and show off. That's what that was about. Yeah. But, and I could do it enough to get by. Uh, Guthrie was coming in. For, he was playing with duo in, in Louisville. He would drive all the way down. He had heard that CD with me and Johnny Highland in uh, uh, Florabama. Yeah, where he's from. Yeah, yeah, in a music store. They had that CD playing. And he asked the guy, uh, who is that? He said, that's Don Kelly. And uh, he said, man, I like that music. So he found out we were playing at Roberts, I guess. And he would come in on, I think it was Sunday night, because there wouldn't be very many people in there, and he wore that little hat, you know, and he said, at the end of the bar, just sit there. So we, we got through one night, and he, uh, standing out front was Joe's son. You know who Joe's son? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Joe's son was outside, and I walked out the front door, it was the summertime, and Guthrie's walking down the street to our Gruens. This is the way I remember it now. And Joe said, hey, Don, have you ever heard that boy play? I said, who? He said, that that guy right here, he said, he's a damn monster. I said, hey! <laughs> he's walking down the street. <laughs> and he, he turned around and he came back. I said, uh, uh, Joe, tell me you're a guitar player. And I needed one. And he said, uh, yeah. He said, uh, uh, he told me where he's from and where he played. And, that, and, that. and uh, Joe said, hey. <laughs> and I, I said, look, uh, uh you going to come back in town uh, Sunday? And he said, yeah, I'm going to come back. I said, well, you got a Telecaster? 
He said, I got one. He didn't, but he said he did. He brings a goddamn G&L. <laughs> but he did this time. This is the funny part. He didn't bring it. Yeah. That next Sunday, uh, 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 Kenny Vaughn subbing Sunday night. Me and Kenny Vaughn, uh, I think it was Brian Knopf, little electric bass player that played with uh, Marty okay. for a while. Yeah. Yeah, great singer, great friend. And I think it was Brian Knopf. Anyway, Guthrie gets there, and it's Kenny Vaughn. We don't know Guthrie. And Kenny Vaughn, and uh, he comes in with a damn jazz box. A big one. And it ain't even got a strap. Yeah. He's got to sit on the stool. I was like, what in the hell is that? Anyway, he gets on this stool, and boy, from then on, me and Kenny Bond were going. <laughs> I think I did roly poly. I, I, if I remember right, I did everything. I mean, I did truck driving in all. I just, whatever, I just threw everything in. You're putting him through the paces. Yeah. Yeah. And he's on this jazz box, and he's frying it, frying it. Th- but it's, I'm like a magnet. Yeah. Here he comes. And uh, that's, a, that's the way I remember it. But thanks to Joe's son, I would have never said a word yeah. to him. So, again, back to these, you know, how you're finding guys, it's all, it's all word of mouth. Yeah. And you're not, if some guy comes up and tells you that he's like, hey, I'm, I'm so great and I can do anything, it's like, who cares? I, I just blow But if off. Joe's son or someone that you respect, you oh, know, yeah. that you know, yeah. gives a recommendation, that's everything. Yeah, shit. Yeah. He had uh, Ray Fleck for a while, I think. Yeah, before he went with Skaggs. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. he, uh, so, go so, through his son. But he, he brought something else there. He brought the blues okay. into the chicken picking. Yeah. And, boy, he's a great blues guitar player, no doubt about it. Yeah. If he sang, we'd all have to leave town. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling he's, you. He's a great player. Yeah. Yeah, he's a wonderful player. Yeah. So, he, he don't have much focus. He won't look at you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Don. <laughs> Thanks, Don. <laughs> we love you, Guthrie. <laughs> yeah. So... So Guthrie starts getting busy with some other stuff. I think he was playing like some with Patty Loveless, and he was playing. Oh some yeah, they all started flocking in there, yeah. pitching Jerry Douglas and uh, Sam Bush. They all are hanging out in there, you know. And you know, I I don't get starstruck. He's I yeah. give a damn less about them. You know, yeah. they don't pay my bills. Yeah, you know, and uh, yeah, he started subbing out a little bit and. Uh, you know, a lot of people can't do that six nights a week stuff. That's tough. Yeah. yeah. Now, Guthrie, he was a great player when he got there. He was a better player when he left. Yeah, everybody, you know, yeah, four, um, four hours a night, you know, five, six nights a week. It is what it is, and I'm going to buy For Christmas, they all get a pencil and a piece of paper so they can write down what they owe me. <laughs> they all owe me. <laughs> he owes me, and he owes me. <laughs> well, you gotta, you're going to have to send it out to a lot of people. You've had a lot of people in your band. <laughs> yeah. people Some of them going to give a forwarding address. So, <laughs> so Guthrie starts doing other stuff, and then you get you know, our, our friend J.D., who was actually down here earlier. Yeah, and nobody, nobody wanted J.D. in there. Yeah. And, uh, I won't name who. Uh, but, hell, Dave Rowe told me about J.D. He played on that session. Right. And uh, he said, you know, this guy would be a good sub. And uh, uh, I never heard him play. I took him cold, I think. He subbed a Sunday night or something. Ah, shit, I don't remember. But he played real good. And for some reason, Kenny Vaughn had been doing Ghost Riders in the Sky. Complete different version, yeah. you know, to what I turned it into. Hey, a better version. Kenny Vaughn played it great, you know. But it never gets up here. It starts here, and, it, and it's real pretty, and, and yeah. it stays here. Well... I went home, and I, and I don't have a good ear, but I was in my garage with a flat top, and I worked up the head. I started doing that little pull-off thing in a open A string, you know. It sucked, but I was doing that. And I learned the head best I could. It's not yeah. right, but it's close. Yeah. And you recognize the song. Yes. So I told J.D., I said, look, I'm going to play the head twice. You play the head twice, and then uh, it's... Step up time. Yeah. And he, man, that first time we did that, I mean, Dave, Dave Rose's eyes that big around. And mine too. 
And Artie's going. Because <laughs> it was like a psychedelic Artie's, freak Artie's out. looking at me like his dog died. He's a, <laughs> <laughs> and when he started shaking their head, everybody in that building went slap happy nuts. Yeah. So right after we did that song, I, Dave Rowe was passing the jug. I yeah. Said, jug. <laughs> and we sold more CDs in that one night that I remember than we did all week. Yeah. And I said, you know, I'm not very smart, but a lot went on. Yeah. And from when out of the, the money went up, the crowds went up. Uh, you just take what's good about them and use it. Yeah. You know, to my benefit. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so I, that was one one of the things I've always been curious about, Don, is how you know how the Ghost Riders became you know one of the tunes, and I, and I didn't realize it was. Well, you, you know, blame it on me, not Kenny. Yeah. Because he played it right. Yeah. Kenny Vaughn's got a good version of it, but I saw the little bit of of uh, of the crowd when he did it. They yeah. liked that old song. No, 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 no. You know they yeah. they liked it, and he, but he never built it. To what I thought it should be. Yeah. Boy, JD took it he, over the top. He made it into like a psychedelic freak yeah. out. I mean, it was yeah. just like like the Yardbirds or something yeah. like that. It, yeah. it was, it was perfect. Yeah. What he did it, and his tone was good. Yeah. And he can put, he can play too. You know, he, JD ain't half stepping ever. But JD's a blues player, and I told him every time, especially when he, he was getting ready to leave, I said, man. You got to play the blues. Yeah, I said that's what that's what you do. That's what you he know? does. And, yeah, and he does. Yeah, he JD's a monster. Yeah. they all are. Every damn one yeah. of them. So next, you know, of course, JD started kind of doing his 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 own thing, and he kind of transitions out of the band. And Daniel Donato comes in, and he's probably the youngest guy to ever come through the band. I mean, what yeah. wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. I, yeah. I don't check their ID. I don't yeah. give a shit. <laughs> yeah. uh, as long as they're, as long as they're yeah. not, you know, Ill illegal yeah. or something. I, yeah. I, so I don't, I don't even know how I got to to, yeah. to know he could play. I don't know. Yeah. So he he was coming. So then you you have you have Donato and then uh, and then you know like Porter kind of comes back in and then uh, now, now Porter we can't leave Porter out. Yeah. Porter is a Sunday night guy. Me and Porter and Josh Headley. And uh, Dave Rowe's son had a band. That was a fun night. Sunday night was my favorite for a long time. Wow. Until I got Joe. Yeah. And then and I didn't want to play bass no more after that. Sorry, I gave him Sunday night for that reason. Wow. Yeah. So but, uh, so during, during the, uh, JD's time, you, you get Joe Fick. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's he, here with you know, us today. JD tells me about Joe. Yeah. He's friends with... Uh, the Dempsey guitar player, which right. was their high school band. And they moved to Nashville as kids to play uh, Memphis music. Yeah. Rockabilly, and they were outstanding show. Yeah. And I never would go over because I don't like it. You know, I don't like it. And JD said, Man, you got to hear I don't give a shit about that, JD. And he said, Man, the bass players, you know, I had Dave Rowe. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And boy, first time I got Dave Rowe in the band, and and he did the slap thing, boy, another light went off. Yeah. All you of a sudden, know. that rockabilly thing wasn't so bad. Well, the slap bass was great. Right. Uh, I don't yeah. care about the rockabilly shit. Yeah. But he, he, uh, you know, I mean, CDs. Uh, they, uh, and that, he wouldn't even own that CD. Yeah. But anyway, uh, people liked that. You know, they, they want to see these great players play. You can't copy Merle Hacker record note for note. Goddamn, how are you going to do it better than Merle? Yeah. You know, you can do, everybody's going to recognize Working Man Blues, but when it's sold the time, you got to say something. And they all did, every damn one of them. Yeah. And if they didn't, I told them. And the next time, <laughs> they step up. Yeah, or they move on. No, I never fired nobody. Yeah. Well, I did. I fired Red. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so. I love you, Red. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just gonna, you know, give give a little props to to Joe. Joe. Absolutely. Joe 
played you know bass on uh, on the Elvis movie, also That's, along with JD, yes, especially shoot. on some of the early early stuff. So yeah. we want to give Joe, and so Joe comes into the band, and he of course is also from that slapping and popping, and and uh, you know, and, and he kind of brings that element even maybe even more than like Dave. I mean, first time he subbed, yeah, and it was time to play your solo in Truck Driving Man. That was a no brainer for me. Yeah. And he wanted to be in that band, and it showed. He wanted to be in that band. Yeah. And it showed. And uh, now that I laid it in their laps, they got the band. <laughs> yeah. So that that's another kind of important thing. So so you you kind of decided you know to to move down to Florida, and it seems like you kind of laid the groundwork for them to continue on. So was Joe kind of you know kind of like your protege as far as like you know being. Well, uh, he just, uh, you know, that last year or so before that pandemic, I was making him MC more. Uh, I was making him talk uh, in between songs if I was tuned in, you know, just a little yeah. stuff like that. And, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. He's, to, you know, there. You don't. You need to go no further uh, on Lower Broadway. Yeah. And this new little drummer you got, Bill. He's another monster. But when I'm hard on drummers. Yeah. Yeah. And so so after you left... How do you say Billy Van Veet? Vliet. Vliet. That's what I said. Yeah. <laughs> Billy Van Vliet. I don't leave Billy out. Yeah. He, uh, he's filling some big shoes. I've had some good... Uh, Artie's a monster drum. Yeah. We just did a little jam session over at Joe's Airbnb. Me and Artie hadn't played drums in seven years. Wow. He sets up a bass drum and a, and a hi-hat and a snare drum. And the first couple of songs, it was... Well, he, you know, his hands hurt him. Yeah. You know, he, he's old. Like, he's a year or two older than me. But he played together with me 30 years, me and Artie. Different as daylight and dark. He's from Pennsylvania. Yeah. And I'm from North Texas. Yeah. And but opposite the track. And uh, but after he got going, he started smiling, and Luke was killing him on that guitar. I got me, me and Luke and Joe facing... Artie's, it's a little room littler than this. Yeah. And boy, he finally wound up and uh, he was having a big time. And he can play. He can hold a gig right now. He just don't want to, I guess. Yeah. So how did Luke get in the band? Oh, shit. Yeah. Well, I had a drummer named Stan. He was a, uh, uh, who did he play? Did he take? Uh, Artie? No, Matt. It was Stan, then Matt. Oh. Stan, yeah, Artie. Stan, uh, uh, great drummer, good singer. Uh, he's the one that fell through the window. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, I've that's heard Stan. that story. He yeah. was getting his, uh, uh, he was getting his uh, mileage after Ghost Rider. Yeah. You know, this, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and, and I'm just going to, for the, for the, for the, uh, for all, yeah. those, all those kids out in the audience, you know, Roberts is the stage backs up to this big plate glass window, which and, is five feet off the ground. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and and the drummer is is usually backed up right against yeah. you know, near the window because it's not a very big stage, and so so this drummer was playing and he uh, and he fell through the window. Yeah, and yeah. It, it got up, <laughs> dusted. <the guy. laughs> Nobody can you can't make this up. Yeah, and dusted the glass off. Comes back in and finishes the night. We we put tape over. <laughs> yeah, because basically he falls out into the street. Yeah, and then he goes on the street and then goes into the door back onto the stage and, and gets finished. up and plays. Yeah, I yeah. swear to God he did. Uh, <laughs> so we're we're getting, uh, we're getting to uh, we're you know, Luke. If, if I could spell good, I, I damn sure would write a bestseller. Yeah, I, I would call it the ukulele. <laughs> the ukulele. <laughs> so, so, uh, so the drummer recommends Lou. Well, no, well, first this is winter time now. It's cold. Yeah. yeah. And I'm looking out the window, and there's this long-haired kid standing out looking in. He's too young to get in. Yeah. It's cold. He's standing out there. This goes on on Sunday nights and one night during the week, and. Uh, I said, a car pull up, he gets out, he comes to the window, he stands. The car leaves. An hour later, 
what, unbeknownst to me, it's his mama. She drops him off down there. He stands outside to listen to Porter and, uh, was it J.D.? Yeah, Porter and J.D. Uh, but he's outside. And uh, uh, Stan said, uh, have you ever heard that guy's get, that kid play guitar? And I said, I know, I don't know him. He said his daddy's a real good player, too. And, you know, I hear that every seven nights a week. Yeah. Well, anyway, the way I remember it, it's cold. Well, the doorman's over there. Got the door shut. He's over there. I said, hey, tell that kid to come in here and stand by the, by the door. He, he freezing in there. And, uh, well, I knew from standing, he's a guitar player. And so he comes in there, and uh, he stands there. I, I, I did it for several nights, didn't you? Yeah. And uh, how did I come to get you up? Stan said to get you up, didn't he? I think so. Was Stan there, the drummer? Uh, I, th I think he was there, yeah. He got arrested. Huh? <laughs> was it? He got arrested. <laughs> oh, He's oh, saying that, he got that, arrested. Was that the first time? One of them. Well, the anyway, <laughs> what he said. Yeah, he got arrested. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Wasn't my fault. Yeah. And, <laughs> anyway, Luke's standing there. So Porter was playing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Porter was playing guitar. It, was, it had to be Sunday. Porter was playing. And uh, they they handcuffed the guy and take him out. And we're standing there with no drummer. We still got, what, two hours? Yeah, we're standing there and go. I said, well, we'll, we'll just slap bass it. Yeah. And uh, Porter says, no, Don. I get get Luke, uh, let Luke play. I can play drums. And I said, poor, you can't play no damn drums. He said, man, I got drums set up. I can play drums. And if you knew Porter McClister, it's hard to say no to him. He, <laughs> he's he's he, intense. He is not yeah. going to shut up. No. I said, Porter, I'm not going to fool with that. Let's finish this up and go home. Yeah. He said, no, Don, I ain't And he's right in my face now. Yeah. <laughs> we got a few people in there. It's not crowded. We, we got a few people. I said, Damn it. I said, okay, come on. And so Porter gets behind the drum. I said, Luke. And Luke comes up here and I said, uh, and he's got Porter. I guess he's got to come down to here. You know, Porter strap. Yeah, because Porter's said, Porter not a little guy. And I think I tie a knot in that strap, or I had one. Yeah, he tied a knot. I, I tied a <laughs> knot in that strap, so <laughs> I get it where it's high up here. And so we're getting ready to play, and Porter's back. He, Tuning uh, everything, moving everything around. Oh, yeah. yeah. It like, like he's uh, uh, unbelievable. <laughs> and uh, I said, Porter, I said, well, we're not going to do nothing fast. Oh, yeah, that's okay. I can play it. He said, I'm not kidding, Don. <laughs> and Joe's going. <laughs> 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 so I did look up her. I said, uh, son, do you, do you know any of these songs that I do? He said, uh, yes, sir, all of them. I said, you know them all? He said, yes. I said, uh, do you remember what we did? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> I did all of them. Do you remember the first one? Was it Little Sister or something? It might have been like Big River or something. something yeah, right. Real mid tempo. Yeah, yeah, I was taking it easy on Yeah, it. yeah. I was taking it easy on Porter. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, so we do this, and Porter, he's, you know, well, uh, we, did, we got through that song, and it, it was not as bad as I thought. Yeah, you know he he could play a little bit, but then we had to do something with a little tempo. We did some bluegrass. <laughs> I mean, he sweat blood back. He's, he's, <laughs> he Porter yeah. and Luke's burning it. Yeah, and I'm looking at Joe and I'm saying, "Here we go. Here's another one." And I knew, I knew from the time we got through. And we, didn't we sell a lot of CDs that night? Oh, we had. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, I knew that he was the next one. And uh, Porter was not going to be the drummer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But he did great. He did great. And, uh, and, and you found Luke. And I found Luke, and that was the end of that. Yeah. So his daddy had been coming to see me for years. I didn't even know him yeah. at, at all. But uh, he had a CD that he gave that kid when he was 12. And he learned all of them. Johnny Highland's on it. He, you know, he, he learned all of it. Was that the first CD? I think so. Yeah. Wow. Don't act like you don't know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, Damn. so then you, you kind of already told the story of, of your, you know, kind of the reason for you, uh, you know, kind of, you know, moving on and, and, and I think one of the really wonderful things is that the band goes on. Yeah, so, yeah. And so they, they call themselves Kelly's Heroes as Don Kelly's right. Heroes. Yeah. And they didn't spell my name right. Yeah. <laughs> if only I'm they still could. pissed about that. Yeah. <laughs> K-E-L-L-Y. What the hell's wrong with y'all? I got to spell it right. What are you talking about? Oh, you do? Yeah, on the CD. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so guys, you know, the, so people can't see Don with the, with the band anymore, but still the band performs as a trio, and uh, they're still down at Roberts, and they're still playing the same okay. time slot. Yeah, and uh, they, uh, they were going to take that time slot, but they thought better of it. And they made a good decision. Nobody can do that time slot except these guys. Yeah. Nobody. And it makes a difference. But the owner realized that, and they're still down there. Six to and, ten. I can't say enough about that little drummer, my last drummer, Billy. Yeah. Uh, how long did he play while I was there? Six months. Yeah, not yeah. very long. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's another East Tennessee boy, and he's a monster too. Yeah. And he can sing. I didn't know it. Yeah, they're, they're just, what is the guy's name that came in and got you to play the rhyming? Jordan Peterson. Yeah. What? Jordan Peterson. Jordan so, Peterson. Yeah. So, yeah. Hey, do famous, you know about that? Yeah, famous speaker. And so, yeah, I'd heard the, the story of, uh, and, and I believe they posted yeah. about it, where uh, Jordan was speaking at the Ryman, yeah. and he loved seeing them so much yeah. that he had them open the show. He did. So, <laughs> yeah, he did. I mean, I mean that's amazing yeah it is and, amazing story and, and these guys are playing every week six to ten that's right monday through saturday i mean no i mean like wednesday through saturday is that correct no wednesday Two. through saturday yeah oh yeah. wednesday yeah right wednesday through saturday. and so everyone that comes to nashville that's like the one you know must do is you got to go down and see these guys so they can see your legacy but there there is and as good a player as these guys that's what kind of people they are too yeah, you know, I mean, I I know people, yeah. you know, good and bad, and I don't know what side I'm on, but I know good people, and, and these guys are good. To get. I need to talk about uh, Luke's dad. Okay. Yeah, Luke's dad, Scotty. Uh, he was coming to see me. I didn't even know he was. He's come to see me when uh, I think far back as Red. No, just Johnny. Johnny, right, and. Uh, Bought the CDs, and he's a Telecaster wizard, too, his wow. daddy. Yeah, Scott McCurry. Yeah. And uh, uh, his daddy gave the CD to Luke, bought him his first guitar, and uh, Scotty's dream was to be in this band. You know, he didn't tell me this till now, you know. Yeah. I, I didn't even know who he was till Luke. And, and to have his son up there uh, and taking over. Uh, is an amazing story right there. It is an amazing story. And uh, his daddy's a real good player, too. Yeah. Real soulful, and not so much a million notes kind of guy, which is my kind of guy. Uh, he, he's, a, he's a heartfelt Telecaster player, a good one. Yeah. And uh, that whole family is... Uh, and Joe, to step up uh, after Dave Rowe. Yeah. Those are big shoes to yeah, fill. Yeah, that's big shoes to fill right there. And people don't know, Dave Rowe is a hell of an electric bass player, too. That's right. Big time. And a good singer. Yeah, and he played with Johnny Cash and Dwight Yoakam and, and all sorts of other cats. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he used to get me to give him mileage on the microphone. <laughs> Take me 15 minutes to introduce Dave Rowe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not that long. Yeah. Now, Dave Rowe is a, a monster musician, no doubt. About it. And Artie. Dave Rowe brought me Artie, 30 yeah. years worth yeah. of a Yankee from Pennsylvania. And he was a great fit. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. sure was. Yeah. He sure was. Yeah, every guy that, that came in there brought something. Dave Rowe brought, set the standard for the upright bass. Yeah. And showed me that it, if you could slap on them things, you can make me some money. <laughs> and, 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 and they that, did. That's right. And he, he's the best I ever heard. Wow. Best I ever heard. And they, hence, the guys from London that are doing the slap bass videos, they're, they're that's who old, did it. Oh, 
Joe. Oh, you haven't seen that? No, I haven't seen oh, that. Oh my God. You you have to. How, how does he get that? It's uh, Discover Double Bass. Okay, yes, I am. There, so they're in like instructional videos that. Yeah. yeah. So Joe Joe Fick has done these instructional videos on how to do slap bass. That's which, right. Yeah. Okay. It's, yes. It's incredible. Yeah. And who is the other guy they got that we know? Chris Wood. Who? Huh? Chris Wood up from the Wood Brothers. Yeah, the Wood Brothers bass yes. player. And and the electric player that did it. Uh, no electric player, but the, they had. Uh, Oh, it was the Wood Brother guy. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Well, Don, this this has been amazing. I really appreciate the fact that you've taken the time to 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 tell your story. And we're so glad that kind of your legacy, you know, a very sizable, very <laughs> mountainous legacy of, of music and players that you've brought through is continuing on with, with these guys that, that, that brought you here today. Yeah, I, uh, oh, I wouldn't be doing this if, they hadn't asked me, and, no. and, and this guy right here, he he put it over the roof. Well, I went down to see my sister. It had been a, what, a month ago, and uh, every time I go down, we, you know, he's got a '60 Corvette, and uh, we grew up poor, me and him, in the dirt alleys. That's yeah. where we lived. Um, and uh, his mother sold Levi Strauss for a living. She, bless her, she is a frail woman, Miss Hawkham, and. She would walk to work and walk home, and her hands would be the color of these Levi's. From all the dye. From she sewing yeah. them, right. His dad was a barber. And uh, uh, one time my dad, I had a little silver tone guitar. He had to pawn it. Now this is another tearjerker. But that stopped the music from me and David. Yeah. He, had a good, he had his instrument, I didn't have one. She found out how much was against that guitar and went and got it out. And she didn't have no money, but she knew if she got that guitar out, me and David could play. Yeah. So I owe her too. Yeah. But this guy. Yeah. If you got a friend like this guy, you're a rich man. You are a rich man. Good good friends are are, are, yeah. are priceless. Anybody that can teach me how to play this yeah. is a hell of a guy. Well, Don, thank you so much. All right, thank for you for having me down. and uh, putting up with me. And if I made anybody mad, get over it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it, Don. Thank you for having me. And JD, if you're still here, don't play over the vocals. <laughs> All right. Oh, thank you, Don. Well, I don't <laughs> ever play over myself. <laughs>